The House will come to order. Members, take your seats. The Chair recognizes the member from Auburn, Representative Osborne, who moves the House adjourned from the session of March 28, 2024. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it, and the House is adjourned. The House will attend to a prayer by the member from Hampstead, the Honorable Mark Pearson. Would you pray with me, please? Almighty, all-wise, and all-loving one, you gave to your servant, King David, many psalms, one of which begins, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. O oh God, just a few days ago, we saw your glory in the sky, and as we look around us, we see day by day your glory in creation. Inspire us to be good stewards of that creation. We also ask your presence, your guiding hand upon us, and your grace working in us as we do the work set before us as a legislature. So many of us grieve as we see in so many places what the political process has become. Deliver us from that, O oh God, and remind us that the same psalm which began with the heavens giving you glory ends with a prayer that by your grace, each of us can be better and each of us can do better. David ended by saying, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. O oh God, may this be so. Amen. Amen. Chair recognizes a member from Peterborough, Representative Peter Leishman, who will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. The chair recognizes the Seacoast Men of Harmony who will now sing our national anthem.
The House will attend to a request for leaves of absence. Mr. Speaker, the day, illness, Representative Siebert, Sophocles, and Trelevin. The day, important business, Representatives Harley, Judy, O'Hara, St. Clair, and Tatro. The day, illness in the family, Representative Sanborn. These leaves of absence shall be granted unless otherwise ordered by the House. The House will attend to the introduction of guests. Mr. Speaker, please welcome Anna, Camden, and Abigail Bates, Sa Sally, Sarah, Jill, and Luca Varney, and Jackson Brock, guests of Representative Woodcock, Taylor O'Donovan, Rihanna Emmerich Von Ash, and Susan Moeller, guests of Representative Tensar, and Jenna Karen, guest of Representative Damon. They are with us in the gallery today. Welcome to the New Hampshire House. The House will now attend to memorial remarks with a member from Concord, the Honorable Arthur Ellison. The Chair recognizes Representative Myler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to invite down by, to be behind me those who knew Art and who worked with him. Anna and Sally and family, welcome to the house, the people's house. I had the pleasure of being with Art the night before he passed. And these are the words that came to me as I got home, and I'd like to share them with you. Art is gone. His life's journey has ended. He was a fighter and gave so much to others. I've only known Art in his legislative years, but have come to respect his life as he served others in his life. He came to the House Education Committee with 38 years of service in the adult education community through the Department of Education. He enabled those adults who had given up on themselves a second chance a second chance to better their lives. He told me that all he wanted to do was to give voice to the voiceless. And just think of the thousands of lives he touched, which gave them a chance to be their better selves. And talk about feeding kids. He was a master advocate. When he got knocked down on a vote in this house, he did not cower to the opposition, oh no. He came at them again and again, saying, just feed the kids. He was a fighter and an advocate for the underdog. For two years, Art struggled with self. He finally relented to getting a handicapped <clears throat> parking spot at the insistence of the House Democrat education members. He moved from hospital to hospital, trying to cure his heart and lung issues. And then a month ago, he called me and said, Mel, it's time for me to throw in the towel. I said, what do you mean, Art? The doctors have informed me that there's nothing more that they can do for me. I just want to come home and be with my friends. So home he came. He came not to an isolated dark room, but to a bright room at the v Hospice Center. And when the word got out that he was in hospice, the parade started. His friends, his colleagues, his teammates, they came to celebrate his life. It was an opportunity to share stories, experiences, and life with those who came to bid their final farewells to him, to a guy who gave so much. And in him, exposing himself to others, his smile, his humor, his spirit, he gave us all a gift on how to die with dignity. This was his lasting gift to me. Celebrate 
Celebrate your life with others. Invite them in, engage them, laugh, cry, hold their hands, hugs, as he did in his life with others. He gave voice to us to be with him. As we enter this life passage with art, we obviously challenge our own mortality. We know that there are only two certain things in life, and that is that we die, we are born, and we die. The question is, is what do we do between those two life events? The last time I was with Art, he was in his last deep sleep. I held his warm hand and told him of the life that he made a difference in others. And as I talked, his shallow breathing became deeper and I could feel that he heard my voice in the acknowledgement of his life's accomplishments. There will surely be regrets. I didn't spend enough time. What more could I have done? We had unfinished business. I didn't have a chance to shoot hoops with him. But he would say, move on. He would say, don't dwell on the current, but always move forward. The Buddhist faith has the belief in the concept of impermanence, that life is ever changing, life is always moving, it never stays the same. We are in that moment. We can be sad and we can share the loss of Art Ellison, but he would say, come on, come on now, let's move on. The sorrow of the moment will soon be replaced by the fond memories of the past. So let's remember Art for his contributions to others, to our own life, but move quickly. For what Art would say right now would be, fight on. Never give up. Oh, yeah. Just feed the damn kids. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can we all raise for a moment of silence for our fallen colleague? Without objection, the, the comments will be printed in the permanent journal. Chair recognizes the member from Ringe, Representative John Hunt, for the purpose of Tartan Day ceremony. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, incredibly, this is the 27th anniversary of the New York Hampshire's House celebrating Tartan Day. When our former colleague, the late Representative Steve Avery of Dublin, first led this ceremony in 1997, most in this chamber were not yet representatives. Some of you weren't even born yet. However, this day has become not only a symbol of honoring a great people, but it has become a historical part of our house tradition, and one in which many of you come to look forward to. So we're back. April 6th is Tartan Day, adopted by the President, Congress, and our Governor, and marks the day the Declaration of Arbath was signed in 1320, which was the Declaration of Scottish Independence from Britain. This document was credited as a model for our own Declaration of Independence. And perhaps one of the most important lessons from this document is this quote. It is in truth, not for glory, nor riches, nor honors that we are fighting, 
but for freedom. For that alone, which no honest man gives up, but with life itself. The Scots have pioneered uh, in many ways in our civilization. Alexander Graham Bell with the telephone. Alexander Fleming discovering penicillin. penicillin <laughs> Adam Smith founding political economics. Arthur Conan Doyle with his mystery novella. John Paul Jones with his modern naval tactics. John Muir creating the US national park system. And of course, Sean Connery as James Bond. Today would not be possible without groups like our friends at the New Hampshire Scott, who have organized this widely popular Highland Games every year since 1976, and our friends at the Scottish Arts. Scottish Arts has been achieved notable success as solo competitors at very levels in the fields of piping, fiddling, and even dancing. Well, with that, Mr. Speaker, please join with me in welcoming the fiddlers, uh, the Mariel Webster and Samuel Stalker, and pipers William Todd, Matthew Schottman, James Fox, Callum Stalker, and of course, the original pipe major, Campbell Webster, as they perform for us. Today would not be possible without groups like our friends at the New Hampshire Scott, who have organized widely. You already did that part. Oh. <laughs> Before we entertain with more music, I like all of those who have with tartan today, who wore their tartan today, to please rise and be recognized. So all of you have some tartan. Look at that. Awesome. Thank you for wearing them. Okay.
Mr. Speaker, we now arrive at the solemn part of our ceremony, where, as we have in the past, we remember and pay tribute to our departed House colleagues who passed away uh, this session. Please rise as we honor those among us who have passed in our special way, Representative Roger Menninger, Sharon Norgren, and Arthur Ellison. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and with the members, please be seated. I'll now like to uh, invite the House Clerk with a grace, with a special Scottish blessing. Bless this house and those within. Bless our giving and receiving. Bless our words and conversation. Bless our hands and recreation. Bless our sowing and our growing. Bless our coming and are going. Bless all who enter and depart. Bless this house, your peace impart. Mr. Speaker, members of the House, thank you for your attention today as we celebrate this wonderful event. Once again, I'd like to tr thank our friends at the Scottish Arts in New Hampshire, Scott. We're grateful for your attention today. So until we meet on the Bonnie, Bonnie Banks of Loch Lomond, may your days be long and the thistles in front of you bright. This concludes our event. For what reason, the member rise? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, may I first ask that the remarks 
of our good friend from Ringsby Place in the Permanent Journal. It may also point out, Mr. Speaker, that some of us are wearing the Irish national quilt today. That is the plaid of the quilt that was wrapped around the body of General Michael Collins when he was killed in Beel Nabath in August of 1922, uh, fighting for Irish unity and Irish freedom. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Without objection. It is uh, my great, great pleasure to introduce a friend of the United States and a country that is our friend in Asia. Our guest today has an impressive resume that covers a career spending almost 30 years in the foreign ministry. He first entered into the foreign ministry in 1997 and has served in various capacities including first secretary to many embassies, including Israel, Russia, and Mission of EU, Belgium. He was Deputy Consul General in Houston, Texas, Minister of en Embassy in Sweden, and Deputy Secretary to the President for Protocol, and now is serving as a Consul General to the Republic of the Korea in Boston. His experience in fostering and strengthening relationships with numerous embassies both here and abroad, have secured the trust, friendship, as those he has worked with. Now, as a friend to New Hampshire, and in the spirit of our relations between the public of Korea and the United States, I'd like to give a warm welcome to Council General Kim J. Wee, and thank him for joining us in New Hampshire House of Representatives today. Thank you very much. Very warm welcome. Honorable Showman Adam de Pecker, Speaker of the House, and respected the representatives of the General Court of New Hampshire. I am deeply honored to have the privilege of addressing this the esteemed chamber today. And this is my first time to visit actually Concord II and inside of that house. I arrived around one hour ago, but I am already got very strong impression about this house's long history, and especially very warm hospitality. Thank you very much. Allow me to express my heartfelt appreciation for the opportunity extend to me as the Consul General of the Republic of Korea to speak before all of you. I'm generally the grateful for the warm welcome and generous hospital hospitality according to me. Today, I wish to reflect upon the enduring relationship between Korea and the state of the New Hampshire, as well as the aspiration and contribution of the Korean American community in the state of the New Hampshire. My aim is to underscore the promising potential of our mutually beneficial future across the various spheres, including economy and culture and the beyond. As we contemplate the century-old ties between Korea and New Hampshire, a moment of particular significance emerge. The Portsmouth Peace Treaty of 1905. This pivotal moment not only underscore the relationship between Korea and the United States in the early 20th centuries, but also the offer the insight into the Korea's the trajectory. Following the acknowledgement of the Portsmouth as the host city, 
the peace treaty at the conclusion of the Russo-Japanese War in 1905, two Korean individuals, two Korean gentlemen, one preacher and the other one a graduate student, ardently sought an audience with then U.S. President Theodore Roosevelt, bearing the letter of appealing of the desperate hope of the Korean people for my country's independence. They sought the support for the vulnerable Korea from the United States. The United States is the first the diplomatic the, the friends, allies in our history in international ally. That time in 1905, Korea was slipping into the grasp of then Japanese the colonialism. Despite their meeting with the Secretary of State, then Secretary of State did William Taft, and also the President himself, their lack of the familiarity of the international politics and rigor, the constraint of the time, they unfortunately could not participate in the Postmas the Peace Conference, and even they were hindered their conveyance of Korean wish to the conference itself. I envision now two Korean gentlemen standing outside the venue of the conference, the naval shipyard of Portsmouth during that the peace treaty, the, the peace treaty the proceedings. Maybe they were weeping and they thought about the Korea's future, very the, the desperate future of the Korea. 43 years later, one of them, one of them, the greatest student, he became the Korea's the first president of independent country. While the initial interaction between Korea and New Hampshire may have been marked by these historical challenges, it has evolved into a relationship characterized by hope. Korean immigration to the New Hampshire is set to commence in the early 1960s, primarily consisting of families accompanying the U.S. military personnel stationed at mainly the former Peace Air Force Base in the town of Newington and Greenland and city of Portsmouth. Today, we start the Korean immigration start like this, but today, a very vibrant Korean community of approximately 5,500 Korean American and Korean nationals reside here, actively contributing to the community and enriching the state's diversity. I, today, I'm very much privileged to introduce a few the Korean leaders of that the Korean American community here we are, who are present in this chamber today. The second floor, the first law, a few Korean the leaders they are present today. Could you stand up? <laughs> Thank you. Our partnership, though relatively young, is founded on mutual respect and cooperation, bolstered by the strong alliance between the United States and Republic of Korea. Last year, 2023, was a very special year, marked the 70th anniversary of our alliance. At the same time, 120 years anniversary of Korean immigration to the United States. Last year, this special year, was celebrated by the state visit of the President of the Republic of Korea, 
to Washington, D.C. at the same time to Massachusetts, Boston, and ele ele elevating our relationship to a global comprehensive strategic alliance. It means that the Republic of Korea and United States will increase our comprehensive the global cooperation, deepen our robust regional engagement, and broaden our bilateral ties guided by our shared commitment such as universal human right, freedom, and rule of law. Korea and, United Korea and the state of New Hampshire have explored opportunity for collaboration across various domains, including trade and advanced technologies and the machine manufacturing, education, and also winter sports and tourism, very many various areas, while our relationship has yet to reach its full potential in terms of economic cooperation, trade, and human exchanges, we acknowledge the promising prospect for cooperation in many fields, which I will elaborate on shortly. Furthermore, our relationship is deeply intertwined with the valor and sacrifice of New Hampshire's son and daughters, who bravely fought as Korean War veterans and as soldiers on U.S. bases in the Korean Peninsula. During the Korean War from 1950 to 1953, more than 10,000 soldiers from the New Hampshire fought together with Korean soldiers. Among them, 137 sons from the New Hampshire, they made it ultimate sacrifice. Their contribution, their sacrifice, their devotion raised the foundation for Korea's rapid development into a vibrant democracy and economic powerhouse. We, the Korean, Korean community and all every Korean commemorate their service, their devotion, and their sacrifice through memorials and commemorations, underscoring their pivotal role in Korea's transformation. Every year, around the date of July 27, the date of the armistice, signing of the armistice of the Korean War, at the Boskawan the State Veteran Cemetery, Korean American the Association in New Hampshire, together with Veterans Association, hold a commemoration ceremony, Korean War veterans and their families. Last year, I had the honor to attend that ceremony and had touching moment meeting Korean War veterans. The ceremony was held for expressing the Koreans' the gratitude to their services of veterans. But one veteran grabbed my hand and said to me, thank you very much for making Korea such a wonderful country. Korea made my effort and my community's sacrifice utmost meaningful. I was speechless and could only express just a thank you to him. This year, the commemoration ceremony will be held at the same venue on July 28th. And I'm looking forward to meeting that veteran again. This time, I will prefer to properly convey my sincere thanks, thanks on behalf of all Korean people. Now, I would like to look ahead to our future.
relations. I envision even greater the potential and opportunity through the activities and initiatives of both the Korean community and business in New Hampshire. Firstly, the Korean American community of New Hampshire actively engage in societal contribution and foster a strong scene, strong sense of citizenship as evidenced by the cultural exchanges event and community activities. Last February, I was invited to 2024, this year's Luna New Year's Festival hosted by the Korean community here. It was held at very beautiful church in the town of Greenland, and it was a wonderful and very beautiful the gathering, bringing together the member of the Korean the community, but also neighbors together. There, I witnessed the future of the Korean community. Korea came to the New Hampshire as a small number of the migrants. They successfully settled down and now integral members of the local community, driven by a desire to make contribution to their communities and fueled by a fashion for the New Hampshire. I believe the Korean American community of New Hampshire will continue to make contribution to their community and deepen diversity as a bridge to promoting mutual understanding among citizens here. Korean business are also eager to explore economic cooperation with New Hampshire. Attracted by very strong high-tech ecosystem here and also its strategic location and also very attractive incentive too. While the investment in New Hampshire have yet to materialize, we believe there is a significant potent, potential for the collaboration. The city of the Portsmouth and also the Manchester and also the city of Concord too be a possible venue, good venue for the Korean business and company to explore new investment and partners. In this regard, I kindly urge the, your attention and also the support. For the mutual the cooperation between Korea and the New Hampshire, I would like to draw your attention one issue. It is regarding to the Korean student who studying in university of, and the college in New Hampshire, who I believe could significantly contribute, contribute to the economic and social the cooperation between Korea and the New Hampshire. New Hampshire is renowned is excellence in fields such as the healthcare, education, and tourism. Currently, there are approximately 200 Korean national students enrolled in New Hampshire, the high educational institution. The number is not being now, but I can say the number is increasing recently. So after the pandemic, the number of the Korean the exchange students come to the New England area. So the number of students looking for the opportunity in New Hampshire is increasing. In total number in New England area, the Korean students is around 3,500. All the United States, 44,000 the Korean students. The number itself is number third. The Chinese and next India and the South Korea, Republic of Korea, the, the number of the student is number is third places in student in exchange program. But if you think about the size of the population of those three countries, China, India, there's more than a billion people live there. In Korea, now we have around 50 million. Yes, huge number, small country. But if you consider the number, size of the population, how many Korean students try to come to the United States for studying and for their 
the future of the job and professional. Matter is, despite the Korea being a close ally and the major investor in critical supply chain for the United States, Korean students are facing some status problem. These are the problems upon graduation, some of them forcing to leave the United States. The Korean government is striving to increase the visa quarters for the Korean through the bipartisan bill called the Partner with Korea Act, which aim to enable highly skilled Korean professionals to contribute to the United States. Taking this opportunity, I kindly request the support of New Hampshire's state, the registrator present here, to endorse our Korean government effort and urge member of the U.S. Congress both in the House and Senate to recognize the significance of the bill and facilitate its passage. Before this meeting, I have a short meeting with the speaker in other step of the State House. I heard that very the interesting suggestion that so not, they really they try to attract some Korean business to come to the New Hampshire, some manufacturing factories or R&D, or any kind of the corporation. I think if we can find, a, find out a good solution to this kind of status problem of the Korean student, it would be very big helpful for the Korean company to find the opportunity in New Hampshire too. In addition to economic cooperation, I have to also mention that cultural and then tourism cooperation between Korea and New Hampshire will continue to expand. I think the representatives, so you might heard about the Hallyu, Korean wave, K-pop, K-drama, and the Parasite and many dramas. So the very story of the remarkable the resilience and innovation of the Korean culture is gaining now the global the prominence. prominence. As you know, the cult culture serves as a potent instrument for understanding and building friendship. Hallyu offer very nice opportunity, good opportunity for the Korean community here too, to celebrate their own the heritage, especially for the young generation. But also, I believe the Korean culture can play very important more important roles in making more friends, making the different, our understanding together. My office and Korean government, we will try hard to showcase and also share this Korean culture with the community here. Distinguished Speaker of the House and all the respected representatives, based on the historic ties between Korea and New Hampshire, and with an active and very healthy Korean-American communities, and considering the promising potential of mutual cooperation, and most of all, with heartfelt gratitude to the service and sacrifice of the son and daughters of New Hampshire to the peace and prosperity and stability of the Korean Peninsula, both the Korean community here and also Korean consulate office and myself and my colleagues, we are committed to promoting New Hampshire in Korea and fostering mutually beneficial cooperation across various sectors. Let us continue working together to strengthening the bonds between Korea and New Hampshire for the betterment of both our communities. Let us strive to further fortify our partnership and friendship for the future. Thank you for listening. 감사합니다. Yep.
what reason does the member rise? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move that the remarks from the Consul General be printed in the Permanent Journal. Without objection. The House will now attend to the consent calendar. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, from the Committee on Children and Family Law, Senate Bill 359, removed by Representatives Yokella, Hole, Santanastasa, Tony Lekas, Tom Mannion, Alicia Lekas, Gerhard, Cordelli, Dry, and Petterno. From the Committee on Children and Family Law, Senate Bill 498, removed by Representatives Leon, Granger, McGew, Tom Mannion, Tony Lekas, McCarter, Petterno, Papavucci Mueller, Alicia Lekas, and Love. Are there any other bills to be moved? Representative Osborne moves a consent calendar with the relevant amendments as printed in today's House record be adopted. You ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Those opposed nay. The ayes have it. Consent calendar is adopted. Chair recognizes the clerk. Mr. Speaker, the Senate concurs with the House in the passage of the following entitled bill with amendment in the passage of which amendment the Senate asks the concurrence of the House. House Bill 261, relative to rights of tenants in cases of domestic violence. Representative Lynn moves we concur and is recognized to speak to the motion. Thank you, uh, colleagues. I, I move to concur uh, on this bill. You may recall we, uh, when the House passed this bill, um, it contained two provisions. One was a provision to allow um, a person who was a, a victim of domestic violence to basically um, have that as a basis to terminate a lease. And the second was to allow a person who was a victim of, uh, who, was, who had uh, uh, been a victim of an accident or illness to, uh, to uh, terminate the lease. The Senate removed the second part, which really had nothing to do with the main part of the bill that dealt with domestic violence. It also made some changes uh, to extend the period during which the domestic violence might have occurred. I believe our bill said 60 days. The Senate increased that to 150 days, and it also increased, uh, expanded the types of notice that could be given uh, by a person who, who uh, was a victim of domestic violence. Importantly, this is a, a, an important change that the Senate made. It creates a new grounds for a landlord to evict a tenant who causes domestic violence, um, which, which made, made a lot of sense. And the last thing is, it is already part of New Hampshire law that a, um, a person who is a victim of domestic violence uh, may not be evicted for that purpose alone. This, uh, the Senate version, expands what, uh, what types of proof can be offered um, to, uh, by, su by such a person. Uh, the Judiciary Committee considered all of the changes thought it was appropriate to concur, so I recommend that the House concur. The question is on the motion to concur on House Bill 261. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed nay. The ayes have it. The motion passes. Chair recognizes Representative Weiler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to remove House Bill 1560 from the table. I'd like to speak to my motion. You can't speak to it. You're requesting a I request a division vote to remove House Bill 1560 from the table. It is important in today's dealings in finance. Thank you. Please support it. This is a division vote. The, the motion is to remove. 1560 from the table. This is a division vote. Members, take your seats.
Members, take your seats. This is a division vote. This is a division vote. Chair recognizes Representative Walner for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that this body voted to lay this bill on the table, and if I know that's the place it should stay, would I now vote no? Thank you. Chair recognizes Representative Weiler for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that the whole calendar before us is reliant on taking 1560 off the table and passing it with a two-thirds vote. The 34 bills, if I know that the 34 bills before us on, from the Finance Committee, that almost half of them passed unanimously because they were widely supported in this House. Many of them have general funds to fund them. If we do not remove 1560 from the table, and if we do not pass it by two-thirds, how are we going to take care of those important things that need general funds that you will see in this calendar? Please vote yes to take this off the table. Push the green button. I thank you. Motion before us is to remove House Bill 1560 from the table. This is a division vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. Make sure your stations are on. All members present had an opportunity to vote. House will tend to stay to the vote. 177 voting A, 201 voting A. The motion fails. Chair, chair recognizes the clerk. Mr. Speaker, Senate Bill 523 has been sent over from the other body. Uh, and at this point, because the subject matter was indefinitely postponed, the only way that that can be introduced is with a vote um, of two-thirds to consider introduction. So the motion uh, at this time would be to consider um, whether to introduce. Motion before us is to consider Introduction of Senate Bill 553-FN. This, this will be a division vote. Members, take your seats. The motion is to consider allowing Senate Bill 223 FN to be introduced. This is a division vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds.
Tim Elberger. Well, lacking two thirds, you can all see the motion failed. Attend to the regular calendar. Committee on Finance, Stuart Jose Furt, House Bill 318 FNA, an act relative to bail commissioners and making appropriations to the judicial branch. Consider the same, report the same with the following amendment. A recommendation bill ought to pass with amendment. Senator Peter Leachman for the committee. The amendment is 1404H, printed in House Record 14, pages 24 through 31. The question and the motion is on the amendment. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it, and the amendment is adopted. The motion before us now is ought to pass with amendment. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it, and the committee amendment is adopted. On the last vote, Representative Sidetech declared a conflict and did not participate. Majority of the Committee on Finance to which was referred House Bill 1005FN, an act relative to judicial training. Considered the same, report the same with the following resolution resolved that is inexpedient to legislate. Representative Dan McGuire for the committee. Minority of the Committee on Finance to which was referred House Bill 1005FN. Having considered the same, being unable to agree with the majority, report the recommendation bill ought to pass. Representative J.R. Hull for the minority of the committee. For what reason does a member rise? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move to table HB 1005. It is a proper motion. The motion before us is to table House Bill 1005. Are you ready for the question? Are you ready for the question? A division has been called. Members, take your seats. The motion before us is to table House Bill 1005. This is a division vote. The chair recognizes Representative Sweeney for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I know the contents of HB 1005 were just included in the bipartisan bail reform package we just voted for, and Mr. Speaker, if I further know that tabling the contents of HB 1005 might be able to protect it from any nonsense the other side of the wall might bring to it. Would I now vote green to table HB 1005? Thank you. Chair, recognize Representative Poole for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that the contents in HB 1005 are in House Bill 318, but the issue is so important, it should stand on its own. If I know that training those who oversee family court issues is of utmost importance to our citizen, would I vote against the table motion so we could pass the bill separately to send to the body behind us? Thank you. The motion before us is to table House Bill 1005. This is a division vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds.
Mr. All members present had an opportunity to vote. House will attend the state of the vote. 348 voting nay, 33 voting nay. House Bill 1005 is laid on the table. Majority of the Committee on Finance, to which was referred House Bill 1178 FN, act relative to an employee's unused earned time. Consider the same, report the same with the recommendation the bill be referred for interim study. Senator J.R. Hull for the majority of the committee. Minority of the committee. Having considered the same and being unable to agree with the majority, report with the following amendment and the recommendation that the bill ought to pass with amendment. Senate Representative Chuck Grassi from the minority of the committee. Chair recognizes Representative Grassi. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. House Bill 1178 uh, is a bill that we heard before the committee, and we've had it before the committee many times. It's been before this floor. We've passed it out of this floor many times before. When it came to the Finance Committee, it came basically with no cost. The bill didn't cost us a thing. What I'm hoping today is that we'll be able to overturn this interim study report and recommendation, and that we can move on to further, further question to pass this. The amendment that we have proposed addresses concerns that UNH had and limits the accrued time to 30 days. The bill, more importantly, only affects businesses that have 15 or more employees. And it only affects those situations where a business closed, is sold, or people are laid off. Now, this is important, particularly the last one. I have a true story I can tell you. I will tell you of two employees that work for a business. One employee started, applied, applied for a job, and was hired for that business. <clears throat> the, the in handbook said that during your first year of employment, whenever you are hired, you get three days of free time or personal time or sick time that you can use. This person started in February. Your accrued vacation time starts in January, and it accrues on January 1st. That's when you get your vacation time. And after working one year, you get one week accruing on January 1st after that first year that you've worked. After three years, you get two weeks. After five years, you get three weeks. And after 10 years, you get four weeks of vacation. Second person started working for that same company. He started in August. His time, he'd only worked there for three years. The first employee worked there for 10 years. So he had four weeks of employment. The second gentleman, Stott's company, he worked there for three years when COVID hit. COVID hit in March. Human Resources came in that morning and said to all the employees, business will be closing at midnight tonight. Your insurance, your personal health insurance will end at midnight tonight. We'll call you back when we see if, how, things, how things play out with this COVID issue. The second employee who had been there for three years used his vacation time, his two weeks which he had vacation time, used them in February. The second person who had been there for 10 years was planning on taking two weeks in the summer, one week at Thanksgiving and one week at Christmas, which he had usually done throughout the year. Prior to getting four weeks of vacation, he was going to take one year in this week in the summer, one year at Thanksgiving, one week at Christmas. He got nothing. Not a thing. You may hear that this bill overrides human, union contracts. It doesn't. You may say that this is going to affect businesses inappropriately. It doesn't. It affects those people who have been laid off with a promise that they were going to get vacation time and then did not get their vacation time. Or if a business is sold or a business closes, 
they will receive the time that was promised to them in the handbook. Most handbooks say you only will get your vacation time if you leave employment, you give your two weeks notice. Well, when you're laid off or the business closes, you can't give two weeks notice. And so businesses have been using that not to pay accrued time. Time that you have worked for and you have earned. Many people on high tech say, well, we have flex time. They can take as much time as they want. Well, statistics have shown that that doesn't always work out and they don't usually get as much time. But this bill is not something that is for those people. This is something that is for the people who work hard, work hourly, show up every morning, go home every evening, or show up every evening and go home every morning. It's for those people, hourly employees. We're capping this at 30 days that have accrued time, so a business would not be responsible for any more than that. But it's a fair thing to do. When you came here, you came here to represent your constituents. Those people who go to work in the morning, those people who carry the lunch pail, this is a bill for them. I would encourage you to vote no on this interim study so that we can bring an amendment and an ought to pass motion on this bill. Thank you. Chair, recognize Representative Infantine. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The motion on the floor is for interim study. I've learned a lot of things in my tenure here in the legislature. If you spare me a minute or two, I'm going to tell you a couple things I've learned. I was younger years ago, and Representative Norelli was the Speaker of the House. And a bill came in front of Labor, and it wasn't quite ready. It got passed through the House and the Senate. The governor signed the bill. The hue and cry because of the bill that came from business owners in New Hampshire, both Democrat, Republican, and Independent, was so furious that the first order of business, the second year of the term on Organization Day, was to repeal that bill. The bill wasn't ready. I won't pass another bill again that's not ready. I don't think this is ready. I'm not going to discount, and, and, and the second thing I've learned is not to pass something in the House when I know in here that it's not going to go any further in the other body. I don't discount what the previous speaker stated. The law as it is now needs to be amended, needs to be tweaked. The bill has three parts to it, two of which I agree to, agree with, and would support, and have told the sponsor I will support ad nauseum. The third one is not. It's not ready, and I don't want to go back to what happened the last time, that I didn't speak up hard enough that we have to repeal a bill on Organization Day the next day. I would appreciate if you would go with the motion on the floor of refer for interim study. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I would like a roll call. Representative Vimtine has requested a roll call. Is that sufficiently seconded? It is sufficiently seconded. This will be a roll call vote. Members, take your seats. The motion before us is interim study on House Bill 1178. A roll call has been requested. Chair recognizes Representative Michael Cahill for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I know that in the interest of fairness to employees and employers, 
who, re who value their employees and want to retain them and, and have them have long careers where they contribute, I think we should, that we should pass, uh, that we should defeat the interim study and pass the bill. Mr. Speaker, if I know that we don't do one size fits all in this, uh, in this body, and that the fact that a, an employer may tell the employee that you have two weeks vacation per year, and because of my one size fits all blanket policy that if, uh, if I lay you off, and it's not your choice, I lay you off that you don't get the vacation pay, I think, that's, I think we should, shouldn't allow that in the state of New Hampshire. Then I would say that we should vote down the interim study and, and press the red button. Then, Mr. Speaker, would I now conclude and ask you to again press that red button so we may go forward and, and impress the uh, other body with our steadfastness and uh, pass this bill? Thank you. Chair, recognize Representative Infantine for parliamentary inquiry. Representative Infantine weighs off. The motion before us is interim study on 11, House Bill 1178. This is a roll call vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. All members present had an opportunity to vote. House will attend the state of the vote. 188 voting nay, 193 voting nay. The motion fails. Representative Grassi moves ought to pass and offers a, f amendment 1256H printed in House Record 14, page 31. Are you ready for the question on the amendment? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. No. Vision has re been requested for clarification. Only people in the chamber can vote. Your voting stations should be open. The motion is a clarification vote on the amendment. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. If all members present had an opportunity to vote, House will tend to stay the vote. 197 voting nay, 185 voting nay, the amendment is adopted. The motion before us now is ought to pass as amended. Representative Granger has asked for a roll call. Is that sufficiently seconded? It is sufficiently seconded. This will be a roll call vote. Members, take your seats.
The motion before us is ought to pass as amended on House Bill 1178. This is a roll call vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. All members present have an opportunity to vote. House will tend to stay to the vote. 198 voting nay, 183 voting nay. A motion of auto pass is amended, is adopted. Majority of the Committee on Finance to which was referred House Bill 1199 FNA, an act relative to services of the Office of the Child Advocate for Youth Experience in Homelessness and making appropriate appropriation therefore. Considered the same, report the same with the following resolution, resolved that it is inexpedient to legislate. Senate Sweeney from the majority of the committee. Minority of the committee, having considered the same, being unable to agree with the majority, report the recommendation the bill ought to pass. Representative Chuck Grassi from the minority of the committee. Chair recognizes Representative Grassi. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Let's take a look at the financial aspects of 1199 first. This was sent to finance after it came out of the policy committee here in the House. The bill asks for an appropriation of $150,000 to be paid for by the American, from the American Rescue Plan. It doesn't actually ask for any money out of the budget. And it also asks that we look at other federal funds that may be available for child homelessness. In future years, this program would be rolled into the budget. This asks for one position, and the financial audit report that we got from, from the Legislative Budget Office said in the first year they would ask for $82,000, actually. When we look at 1199, we have to consider that youth homelessness in New Hampshire is a critical issue. One in 10 children ages 18 to 24 are in homelessness. One in 30 from 13 to 70 are housing insecure. Recent data shows that New Hampshire has one of the top three largest increases in youth homelessness in the, state, in, in the nation. HB 1199, relative to services of the Office of Child Advocate for Youth Services Experience Hol Homelessness, asked for one coordinator. Right now there are two people in that department and what they do is they work with people that are in the system. If a student is, or a child is in DCYF, the juvenile justice system, or foster care, they get services from the advocate. And that covers a lot of kids in our state. Statutorily, this department is required to work with those children. But there is a small group of children that are outside of that cate these categories that are not picked up and cannot be picked up statutorily. They cannot work with these children. Many of the children that are, that are found homeless in schools, when they're reported, they may be reported to DCYF, only 50% of those kids are actually picked up. The rest of them are said, no, you know, go back and work with your family. We see, we see many of these children who are LGBTQ, many families, full families that are homeless, or people that, children that are not, who are out of their homes for another reason. They are being missed with the services that may be available to them. The majority report talks about, well, this increases the age to 25 as well, so we're gonna pick up a lot of people that, that are older and that they're adults. Well, HUD actually redefined what a youth is, and it basically you're looking at 13 to 25 now by HUD. So if you're looking at federal funds, you've got to expand that age group but we're not really looking at that many people in that category. Last year, the Office of Child Advocate had nine 
sex trafficking cases in the state of New Hampshire, nine. And I know that's an important thing for a lot of people here because I've heard a lot of people talk about sex trafficking. But I've got something different. Sex trafficking, you know, you, you take a look at that, and that's when a child is forced into sex. A, nine, a 2022 study here in New Hampshire showed that there were 1,500 homeless school children. 40% of them participate, now remember these two words, I mean, they participate in survival sex. That's not a choice that they make readily. That's not something they've been forced into. That's something they're looking for a place to lay their head at night or to get a meal. 40% of those 1,500 students who were surveyed said they participate in survival sex. Out of 500, approximately 500 college students who are homeless or housing insecure, they may sleep on a couch, they may sleep in a car, they may sleep in a tent. 26% of them, now these are the older ones who may be able to fend for some, themselves a little bit better, 26% of them experienced survival sex. If we're taking a look at survival sex and we're saying it's not important that we do something about it, by bringing another advocate in the department who can handle and work with these cases, can find these cases and coordinate services, what are we doing and why are we here? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I'll call for a roll call. Chair, recognize Representative Sweeney. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I do want to thank the gentleman from Rochester for his speech. He did lay out the specifics and the facts on this bill, uh, which I do just want to highlight. This bill does expand the role of the Office of the Child Advocate, which is currently focused on those kids in the system. Uh, to individuals, it, this bill would expand their scope to individuals up to the age of 25 that are experiencing homelessness. And while the committee certainly felt that, and, and knows that homelessness is a problem that we have to deal with in our municipalities and throughout the state of New Hampshire, this bill spends money not for one more single bed uh, to be opened up in any town or city in the state. Uh, this bill is using one-time federal dollars from the American Rescue Plan Act that the state has to spend by the end of this year and using that to hire a new state employee, expanding the scope of the current Office of the Child Advocate, and then in the future we'd have to take that employee and pay them with taxpayer dollars. It's not the way we do things here in New Hampshire. We use one-time money for one-time expenses. Uh, this money could be better used on more shelters, on beds to expand the, the need that we have there, not on an additional state employee that is simply going to be a coordinator for the alleged resources that are out there that aren't being connected uh, to those in need right now. Um, I'm not going to belabor the point. It is obviously a, an emotional and charged uh, topic, and, and we all have sympathy for the issue. Uh, but expanding the scope of the Office of Child Advocate to individuals up to the age of 25 uh, using one-time funds for a, for a forever employee that the state would then be on the hook for is just not a sensible policy, in my opinion, uh, and why the Finance Committee urges you to agree with the Majority Committee report of inexpedient to legislate. Thank you very much. Representative Grassley has requested a roll call. Is that sufficiently seconded? It is sufficiently seconded. This will be a roll call vote. Members, take your seats.
Motion before us is inexpedient majority committee report of inexpedient to legislature on House Bill 1199. This is a roll call vote. Chair recognizes Representative Long for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that very little understanding and framework are focused on homeless youth under the age of 18 and above, and if I know that all the New Hampshire data shows an increase in this demographic, and if I know tens of millions of tax dollars are appropriated in servicing adult homelessness and believe we could reduce that amount by investing at the earliest stage, and finally, if I, if I believe 150000 in ARPA funding of this position in the Office of Child Advocacy gives us the opportunity to begin to complete the circle in delivering productive citizens than what I press the red button. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Chair, recognize Representative Weiler for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I know that using temporary funding to hire a new employee is not sound financial planning. We already have a person in the Office of Child Advocate who has taken on some of this challenge. And if I further know that we also have a special committee working on housing, if I know that this may come down to spending money of 150000 that would do very little to solve the problem that has been discussed, would I now push the green button and find some other way to fix this problem? Thank you. Motion before us, the Majority Committee Report of Inexpedient to Legislate on House Bill 1199. This is a roll call vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. All members present have an opportunity to vote. House will attend the state of the vote. 190 voting nay, 191 voting nay. The motion fails. Representative Grassi moves ought to pass. A division has been requested. Members, take your seats. And if Rung requested a roll call, is that sufficiently seconded? Yep. It is sufficiently seconded. This will be a roll call vote. The motion before us is ought to pass on House Bill 1199. This is a roll call vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds.
If all members present had an opportunity to vote, House will tend to stay to the vote. 191 voting nay, 192 voting nay, and I did vote. For what reason does the member rise? Mr. Speaker, I would move to lay House Bill 1199 on the table. Motion before us is to lay House Bill 1199 on the table. A division has been requested. Everybody should still be in their seats. Okay. Uh, roll call has been requested. <coughs> The motion before us is to table House Bill 1199. This is a division vote. Chair recognizes Representative Popovici Mueller for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that when uh, the original vote happened, I uh, inadvertently voted the wrong way on the uh, original ITL motion, would I uh, oppose the motion to table so we can uh, reconsider the original vote? Thank you. The motion before us is to table House Bill 1199. This is a roll call vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you oppose, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. If all members present had an opportunity to vote, House will tend to stay to the vote. 189 voting yay, 193 voting nay, the motion fails. For what reason does a member rise? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move to indefinitely postpone HB 1199. Motion before us is to indefinitely postpone House Bill 1199. A division has been requested. Representative Sweeney asked for a roll call. Is that sufficiently seconded? It is sufficiently seconded. This will be a roll call vote. Everybody was in the chamber. Okay. The motion before us now is indefinitely postpone House Bill 1199. This is a roll call vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. All members present had an opportunity to vote. House will tend to stay to the vote. 192 voting nay, 190 voting nay. Definite postponement passes.
Committee on Finance Stewards referred House Bill 1202 FN, an act relative to issuance of permits for the alteration of driveways exiting into public ways. Having considered the same, report the same with the following amendment. A recommendation the bill ought to pass with amendment. Representative of Tracy Emmerich for the committee. The amendment is 0971H, printed in House Record 14, pages 31 through 32. Are you ready for the question on the amendment? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed nay. The ayes have it. And the amendment is adopted. The motion before us now is ought to pass with amendment. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed nay. The ayes have it, and the committee report is adopted. For what reason is to memorize? I would like to place the remarks on 1199 in the permanent journal. I'm, 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 wait a minute. It's awful, awful noisy in here. Could you please repeat your motion? I would like for the remarks on HB 1199 to be placed in the permanent journal. Without objection. Majority of the Committee on Finance to which was referred House Bill 1212 FN Local, an act relative to eligibility for free school meals. Considered the same, report the same with the following resolution resolved that is inexpedient to legislate. Consent of Daniel Popovici Mueller for the majority of the committee. Minority of the committee, having considered the same, being unable to agree with the majority, report with the recommendation that the bill ought to pass. Was in a merry heat for the minority of the committee. For what reason did the member rise? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move to table HB 1212. Then Sweeney moves to table House Bill 1212. Roll call. Roll. Representative, Luno. Representative Luno requests a roll call. That is sufficiently seconded. This will be a roll call vote. The motion before us is to table House Bill 1212. This is going to be a roll call vote. Chair recognize. Chair recognizes representative for a lad for a uh, parliamentary inquiry. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. If I know, this bill raises the eligibility threshold for the free and reduced program from 185% to 350%, or if amended, 250% at taxpayer expense. And if I also know that we received in committee competing fiscal data reports that ranged anywhere from 50 to 100 million dollars to support this program. Would I then press the green button? Chair, recognize Representative Hall for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know the intent of House Bill 1212 is simple, to support families who are vulnerable by providing greater access to school meals for children, and if I know the school meals play a critical role in a student's attendance, behavior, well-being, and academic success. And if I know that defeating the table motion would give us the opportunity to discuss the merits uh, of House Bill 1212 and the financial impact of lowering the eligibility in cap, income cap from 350 down to a modest 250 percent, 
in an amendment that we would like to present, then would I now press the no button so that we can hear debate on House Bill 1212. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Motion before us at the table, House Bill 1212. This is a roll call vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. All members present have an opportunity to vote. House will attend the state of the vote. 192 voted yea, 191 voting nay. 1212 is laid on the table, and the speaker did vote. The Committee on Finance to which was referred House Bill 1282 FN, an act relative to the duration of child support. Considered the same, report the same with the following amendment and the recommendation that the bill ought to pass with amendment. Senator Jess Edwards for the committee. The amendment is 1186H, printed in House Record 14, page 32. Are you ready for the question on the amendment? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it, and the amendment is adopted. The motion before us now is how to pass with amendment. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it, and the committee report is adopted. Chair recognize Representative Osborne for an announcement. Uh, legislators and staff are uh, welcome to go down to the cafeteria for the annual Walmart uh, lunch and health screening. Yeah. The House will be in recess until 1.30.
and House Bill 1288-FN. Act relative to establishing certain due process rights for students, student organizations, and faculty members facing disciplinary actions by state institutions of higher learning. Consider the same, report the same, with a recommendation the bill ought to pass. Sir Tracy Emmerich for the majority of the committee. Minority of the committee, having considered the same and being unable to agree with the majority resolved, report with the following resolution resolved that it is inexpedient to legislate. Sort of Mary Harkin Phillips for the minority of the committee. The chair recognizes Representative Harkin Phillips. For what reason does a member rise? To make a motion, Mr. Speaker. State your motion. I'd like to um, move to table House Bill 1288. Table House Bill 1288. The, mo the motion, the motion is, is to table House Bill 1288. Representative Sweeney has requested a roll call. Is that sufficiently seconded? It is sufficiently seconded. This will be a roll call vote. Members, take your seats. The House, House will be in order. The motion before us is to table House Bill 1288. This is a roll call vote. The chair recognizes Representative Harkin Phillips to, uh, for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that HB 1288 is a fiscally irresponsible, unfunded mandate charged to New Hampshire's higher educational system, if I also know that H that New Hampshire has already an existing higher educational disciplinary process that's appropriate and fair. And if I also know that New Hampshire taxpayers have already paid for the New Hampshire court system that guarantees and to protect our due process rights, then would I now press the green button and support the motion to place HB 1288 on the table? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Chair, recognize Representative Lynn for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I know that, th that this body considered this bill roughly two or three weeks ago and, that no and, and supported it, and that nothing substantial has changed in the last two or three weeks, including after the Finance Committee's review of the bill, then would I press the red button uh, to, to uh, defeat the tabling motion so that we may proceed to the merits? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I would ask for a roll call vote. The motion before us is uh, tabling House Bill 1288. Roll call is, this is a roll call vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. Damn it, I did it again. I, I did it. House will be in order. Representative Davis, our representative, you need to sit, please. Representative. 
represent Barry. All members present have the opportunity to vote. You already know what the results are. 180 voting yay, 186 voting nay. The motion to table fails. We're back to the original motion of auto pass. Chair recognizes Representative Harkin Phillips. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today in opposition to the auto pass motion for HB 1288. Sponsors of the bill seek to correct a perceived unfairness within the higher education disciplinary process so that a more robust due process right system is assured when students, faculty, or organizations face suspension, expulsion, or termination. The sponsors say more due process equals more fairness, and more fairness, that's just a good thing. But guys, th th this bill is not that simple, and it has serious consequences. Mr. Speaker, the math just doesn't add up. So let's crunch the numbers. Zero. Zero evidence was presented of any student, faculty member, or organization within New Hampshire's higher ed system that was denied their due process right when undergoing a suspension or a greater discipline. Why? Because those currently subject to potential discipline are already given notice of the charges for which they are accused, a meaningful opportunity to respond, and an impartial decision maker. These are all essential elements to due process. Here's another number, zero. Zero students, faculty members, or organizations who are denied access to the existing New Hampshire court system to seek remedies for these supposed due, vi due process violations. How about one? One giant conflict of state, federal, and contract law. Under this law, state law would be required to put a pause on all higher educational disciplinary processes while criminal cases are working through the New Hampshire court system, which we all know takes some time. But under federal law, with millions of in Title IX funding tied to it, that federal law requires immediate protective order enforcement for cases involving sexual harassment, sexual violence, and racial discrimination. Further, this bill would put into state law a direct conflict with collective bargaining agreements in the higher educational community for faculties because, uh, because faculties have shared governance agreements and independent ar arbitration clauses built in to their contracts. Here's another one. Zero. Zero attention paid to the unintended consequences of this bill. With all the focus on the rights of the accused, there was no concern about the absence of federal rules of evidence protecting vic victims' rights who are uh, subject to sexual violence. Zero. Zero appropriations are tied to this bill, although it's clear there would be a significant increase in New Hampshire's higher educational system's administrative burden. That's right, the university system anticipates a one to two million dollar increase, and the community college system anticipates over $370,000 increases of expenses per year to comply with this bill. So make no mistake, HB 1288 is an unfunded, a hefty unfunded mandate of state law. One more number, zero. Zero estimates of the true cost, the true unknown but very significant legal cost to defend New Hampshire's educational systems under this bill. Taxpayers will ultimately pay the price in the probably millions to litigate this bill, and believe me, litigation will be coming. Mr. Speaker, those numbers don't make sense, but here are two numbers that do make sense. One. One existing New Hampshire court system that is already established and paid for by New Hampshire taxpayers that guarantees our due process rights in this bill. And the many other fundamental freedoms that are guaranteed under our state constitution and our federal constitution. One New Hampshire judicial system that has worked efficiently and effectively for hundreds of years and under which the current higher education system's disciplinary process honors. And one. One, HB 1288 is one heck of an example of a fine jobs bill. This bill, if enacted, should forever be known as the Make New Hampshire Higher Ed Acquire Great Attorneys Act. Because as far as I can tell, 
The major beneficiary of this secondary quasi-judicial process within the state higher ed will be the members of the New Hampshire Bar Association. On behalf of all the members, I'd like to thank the sponsors for establishing the tidal wave of impending new jobs for attorneys to litigate the truly novel cases of New Hampshire state law conflicting with federal law and breaches of contract. All parties will be more likely to lawyer up, and come on, who doesn't like more lawyers? So one plus one equals two. That map, that map definitely checks out, Mr. Speaker, and that's two solid reasons for you to oppose the OTP motion. Finally, HB 1288 is a fiscally irresponsible bill when we already have an existing higher educational disciplinary, disciplinary process that's appropriate and fair, and when taxpayers have already paid for the New Hampshire court system that guarantees our due process rights when that process fails. For these reasons, Mr. Speaker, I urge you to vote no on the OTP motion so that another more fiscally prudent motion may be made. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Chair recognizes Representative Lynn. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise as I did two weeks ago, or maybe three weeks ago, in support of the ought to pass motion on this bill. Uh, as was just noted, this bill establishes certain due process rights for faculty, students, or student organizations that are facing disciplinary, significant disciplinary action involving suspensions, etc. One of the things we didn't hear in, from the prior speaker is which of the rights that I'll read to you now are somehow unfair. The right to notice of the charges, to advance disclosure of witnesses and evidence, to the presumption of innocence and a requirement that, uh, that the, the, uh, the, the, uh, al the uh, complainant prove the case by a preponderance of the evidence, the privilege against self-incrimination, the right to confront and cross-examine witnesses, the right to an impartial hearings officer, and I could go on. Which of those is, is a right that's unfair? I submit to you that none of them are. The argument here by the, by the university system is, on the one hand, they say, oh, our system is just fine. There's no problem. Don't worry about it. Well, if that's true, then there is no problem with this bill either, because this bill says if you have an equivalent system, then you can continue to use your system. And while we did hear complaints during this whole process from the university system, one of the things that was very interesting, if this was going to upset all these established procedures that unions and, and, and uh, the, the school had, schools had agreed to, you might think that sometime during the hearing process, we would have heard some people from the union saying, oh, don't do this. This will be terrible if you do it. We heard zero from the unions because they, they, this is not going to be some huge problem. The last point that I'll make is this. The suggestion that there somehow is a conflict between this and federal law and that we're going to get sued, I'll tell you, stop and think about this. This would be the federal government's arguments for trying to defund New Hampshire because we had this law. Well, we should defund New Hampshire because they have a system in place to, to resolve disciplinary problems that's too fair. It gives too much fairness to the parties. Can you imagine? I mean, I, as, you know, as a lawyer, I would, I would pay to sit in the back of the courtroom and listen to that argument before a judge. <laughs> Defund New Hampshire because they have a process that's too fair. I submit to you it's a, it, it would go absolutely nowhere. For the reasons stated, I urge you to vote. Press the green button and vote ought to pass on this uh, motion. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I ask for a division vote. Representative Granger has asked for a roll call. Is that sufficiently seconded? It is sufficiently seconded. This will be a roll call vote. Members, take your seats.
Motion before us is ought to pass on House Bill 1288. This is a roll call vote. Chair recognizes Representative Kate Murray for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I know that the current system is efficient, expeditious, and cost effective, and if I know that our prime sponsor has joined many others in commending our university system for the highly professional manner in which it deals with these complaints, and if I know that this bill only adds another layer of bureaucracy and red tape to a system that is already addressing the concerns expressed in this bill, and if I know that this bill has an unknown fiscal component that could be very expensive and at the same time this bill could put into jeopardy critical federal funding, would I now press the red button to defeat this motion and allow a successful program to function successfully without additional and unnecessary burdens? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Chair recognizes Representative Emmerich for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know this bill is setting forth a standard for all of our institutions of higher education, I can't find a lot wrong with that. And if I also know that, according to testimony from the university system, last year there were 20,000 incidents. Of those, 80 went to a hearing. I don't think that's an overburdensome task for 80 hearings. Please press the green button. The motion before us is the Majority Committee Report of Auto Pass on House Bill 1288. This is a roll call vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. All members present had an opportunity to vote. House will tend to stay the vote. 196 voting nay, 184 voting nay. Committee report is adopted. For what reason does a member rise? To make a motion. State it. Well, state to print motion. the remarks of the last debate in the permanent journal. Without objection. Committee on Finance to which was referred House Bill 1304 FN Local, an act relative to vessel registration and boat fee decals. Consider the same, report the same with the following amendment and the recommendation of the bill ought to pass with amendment. Representative Daniel Popovici Mueller for the committee. The amendment is 0933H, printed in House Record 14, page 32. Are you ready for the question on the amendment? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it, and the amendment is adopted. The motion before us now is ought to pass with amendment. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it, and the committee report is adopted. Committee on Finance, to which was referred House Bill 1307 FN, an act providing a supplemental appropriation for the members of the retirement system receiving an accidental disability retirement allowance. Consider the same, report the same with the recommendation the bill ought to pass. Senator Dan McGuire for the committee. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor? Aye. Representative McGuire asks for a division. This will be a division vote. Members, take your seats.
Motion before us is ought to pass on House Bill 1307 FN. This is a division vote. Chair recognizes Representative Dan McGuire for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just wanted to apologize. My um, blurb in the calendar is slightly incorrect. Um, I, I had the amount 40,000. I'm sorry. <sighs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that my blurb in the calendar is slightly incorrect, and if I know that the correct amount is $50,000, not $40,000, and if I apologize to you, Mr. Speaker, and to the House for that error, would I now press the green button? Thank you. <clears throat> the motion before us is ought to pass on House Bill 1307-FN. This is a division vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. All members present have an opportunity to vote. House will tend to say the vote. 330, 363 voting yay, 17 voting nay. Committee report is adopted. Committee on Finance to which was referred House Bill 1339 FN, an act relative to background checks during motions to return firearms and ammunition. Consider the same, report the same, and the recommendation the bill ought to pass. Representative Joseph Petrie for the committee. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. No. The ayes have it, and the committee report is adopted. Committee on Finance, to which was referred House Bill 1355 FN, an act relative to the New Hampshire National Guard recruitment and reenlistment incentive program. Having considered the same, report the same with a recommendation the bill ought to pass. Senator Joe Sweeney for the committee. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it, and the committee report is adopted. Majority of the Committee on Finance, to which was referred House Bill 1363 FN, act relative to allowing members of the General Court to participate in the Department of Health and Human Services Employee Assistance Program. Consider the same, report the same with the following resolution resolved that is inexpedient to legislate. Senator Jess Edwards for the minority of the majority of the committee. Minority of the committee, having considered the same, being unable to agree with the majority report with the following amendment, the recommendation bill ought to pass with amendment. Senator Laura Tolerski for the minority of the committee. For what reason did member rise? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move to table HB 1363. Representative Moo has moved to table. Uh, House Bill 1363, a division has been called. Members, take your seats. The motion before us is to table House Bill 1363. This is a division vote. Chair recognizes Representative Sweeney for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I know that this bill would enroll state legislators in an employee state system, 
uh, for benefits. And if I further know that we are not employees of the state, we are legislators of the state, would I now press the green button to put this bill on the table? Chair recognizes Representative Tulerski for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that this bill encourages the well-being and productivity of legislators and would help all of us serve our constituents better, and if I know the minority has an amendment that addresses the concerns that majority had in the committee, and we can only see that if we overturn this motion, and if I know that these same constituents that we will be able to serve better sent us here to debate issues like this, and would I vote no on the tabling motion to hear the debate? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The motion before us is to table House Bill 1363. This is a division vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. All members present had an opportunity to vote. House will tend to say the vote. 195 voting nay, 186 voting nay, 1363 is laid on the table. Majority of the Committee on Finance to which was referred House Bill 1394 FNA, an act relative to licensure and regulation of music therapists and making an appropriation therefore. Consider the same, report the same with the following amendment, a recommendation that the bill ought to pass with amendment. It's in Jose Campbellis for the majority of the committee. Minority of the committee. Having considered the same, being unable to agree with the majority, report with the following resolution resolved that is inexpedient to legislate. Representative J.R. Hull for the minority of the committee. The amendment is 1141H, printed in House Record 14, page 32. Uh, are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those, those against say no, nay. Aye. The ayes have it, and the bill now before us is ought to pass with amendment. Representative Granger has requested a roll call. Is that, su is that sufficiently seconded? It is sufficiently seconded. This will be a roll call vote. The motion before us is ought to pass with amendment on House Bill 1394 FNA. This is a roll call vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you oppose, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. House will be in order. If all members present had an opportunity to vote, House will tend to stay to the vote. 195 voting nay, 187 voting nay. Committee report is adopted.
Committee on Finance, to which was referred House Bill 1466 FN, at relative to providing disaster relief funding to municipalities after a natural disaster. Consider the same report, the same with the recommendation of the bill ought to pass. Senator Mary Heath for the committee. <coughs> Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those against, nay. The ayes have it. And the committee report is adopted. Committee on Finance, to which was referred House Bill 1468 FNA, an act directing the Department of Transportation to develop a Conway Branch Rail Line Master Plan. Consider the same, report the same with the recommendation the bill ought to pass. Senator Thomas Buco for the committee. Are you ready for the question? All, all in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. Aye. The ayes have it, and the committee report is adopted. Representative Leachman uh, didn't vote, developed a conflict of interest. Committee on Finance, to which was referred House Bill 1564 FN, an act relative to child support guidelines. Having considered the same report, the same with the recommendation, the bill ought to pass. Senator Maureen Mooney for the committee. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. Committee report is adopted. The committee on Finance, to which was referred House Bill 1570 FNA local an act requiring the Department of Education to conduct a facility assessment of public schools and public chartered schools. Consider the same, report the same, the following amendment, a recommendation the bill ought to pass with amendment. Senator Daniel Popovici Mueller for the committee. The amendment is 1037H, printed in House Record 14, page 33. Are you ready for the question on the amendment? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it, the amendment is adopted. Motion before us now is ought to pass with amendment. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it, and the committee report is adopted. Majority of the Committee on Finance, to which was referred House Bill 1573 FN, an act relative to oversight of and criteria for res residential placement of children. Having considered the same report, the same with the following amendment, a recommendation, bill ought to pass with amendment. Senator Keith Earth for the majority of the committee. Minority of the committee. Having considered the same, being unable to agree with the majority, report with the following amendment and the recommendation of the bill ought to pass with amendment. Senator Mary Jane Walner for the minority of the committee. Majority committee amendment is 1309H, printed in House Record 14, pages 33 through 34. Are you ready for the question on the amendment? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it, and the amendment is adopted. Bills on second reading open to further amendment. <clears throat> Representative Walner offers four amendment. 1472H and is recognized to speak to her amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We just passed an amendment that provides $1 million to the Department of Health and Human Services to enhance their ability to monitor placements of children in, that are in state custody and have been placed in residential facilities many of these residential facilities are out of state. The floor amendment requires the department to report to the legislature quarterly about how the $1 million is being spent and the number of children in residential care and report the number of visits the department is making to the children in residential care. The information will be really useful to the Finance Committee next year as the budget in this area is being developed. Thank you, and I urge you to vote yes. Chair, recognize Representative Edwards. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, if I knew that uh, I, I'm really very appreciative of uh, representative, uh, the representative who just spoke uh, putting in this floor amendment and that it has the support of the, the chair and others in the committee, would I now uh, vote green? 
The motion before us is the Walder Floor Amendment 1472H. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed nay. The ayes have it and the floor amendment is adopted. The motion before us now is ought to pass with amendment. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed nay. The ayes have it and the committee report is adopted. The majority of the Committee on Finance to which was referred, House Bill 1577-FN, act relative to digital images of ballots. Consider the same report to the same with the following amendment, the recommendation of the bill ought to pass with amendment. So if Dan McGuire from the majority of the committee. Minority of the committee, having considered the same, being unable to agree with the majority report with the following resolution resolved that is inexpedient to legislate. Senator so Karen Ebel from the minority of the committee. For what reason does the member rise? To make a motion, Mr. Speaker. State, state your motion. Um, I move to table HB 1577, and I'd like a division vote, please. Senator Ebel moves to table House Bill 1577. This is going to be a division vote. <laughs> Representative Hull requests a roll call. That is sufficiently seconded. The motion before us is to table House Bill 1577. This is going to be a roll call vote. Chair recognizes the House will be in order. Chair recognizes Representative Lane for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that the Secretary of State strongly opposes this bill, and if I know that there are already alternative methods in place to audit ballot counting machines, then would I now push the green button to table this unnecessary bill? And I ask for division vote. Chair, recognize Representative Berry for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I know that the proposed amendment to this bill actually improves the bill, removing the financial cost, and Mr. Speaker, if I know that this will be the ultimate form of a citizen's audit, would I press the red button to oppose the tabling motion? The motion before us is to table House Bill 1577. This is a roll call vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you oppose, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. All members present had an opportunity to vote. I also attend the state of the vote. Under 93 voting A, 188 voting A. House Bill 1577 is laid on the table. Majority Committee on Finance to which was referred House Bill 1583 FNA, an act relative to the per pupil cost of an 
opportunity for an adult ed adequate education. Having considered the same, report the same, the recommendation that the bill ought to pass. Representative Tracy Emmerich for the committee. Minority of the committee, having considered the same and being unable to agree with the majority, report with the recommendation that the bill be referred for interim study. Representative J.R. Hull from the minority of the committee. For what reason did the member rise? To make a motion. Take a, state your motion. To table 1583. The motion is to table House Bill 1583 FNA. I, a division has been requested. Who requested the roll call? It is sufficiently seconded. We just need the name. The motion before us is to table House Bill 1583. This is going to be a roll call vote. Chair recognizes Representative Emmerich for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know many of the provisions in 1583 are being handled by the governor's hold harmless for uh, financially strapped communities, would I, would I now vote to table this bill? Chair, recognize Representative Heath for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I know that this is part of a bipartisan bill that came to us as a result of the special subcommittee, bipartisan subcommittee that worked together, and if I further know this is the first step to bring funds to our school districts in response to the, the court orders, I would ask you to vote red, no, not to table this bill. Thank you very much. The motion before us is to table House Bill 1583. This is a roll call vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. If all members present have an opportunity to vote, House will tend to stay to the vote. 180 voting yay, 201 voting nay, the motion fails. Now we're back to ought to pass. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye! Those opposed nay? No! Okay. We only need one. The vision has been called for clarification. <coughs> Only those in the chamber. The motion before us is a clarification vote on House Bill 1583. This is a division vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds.
All members present have an opportunity to vote. House will tend to stay to the vote. 205 voting nay, 177 voting nay. Committee report is adopted. <laughs> Committee on Finance to which was referred House Bill 1588 FN, an act relative to court jurisdiction over persons receiving special education. Consider the same, report the same with the following amendment. A recommendation bill ought to pass with amendment. Representative David Priest for the committee. The amendment is 1391H, printed in House Record 14, page 39. You ready for the question on the amendment? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it, and the amendment is adopted. The motion before us now is ought to pass with amendment. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it, and the committee report is adopted. Committee on Finance, to which was referred House Bill 1589-FN, an act establishing a veterans treatment court, having considered the same, report the same with the following amendment, a recommendation bill ought to pass with amendment. Senator Dan McGuire for the committee. The amendment is 1396H, printed in House Record 14, pages 39 and 40. Are you ready for the question on the amendment? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed nay. The ayes have it, and the amendment is adopted. The motion before us now is ought to pass with amendment. Are you ready for question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed nay. Aye. The ayes have it. The committee report is adopted. The Committee on Finance, to which was referred House Bill 1593-FN, an act making an appropriation of the Department of Health and Human Services to support recreational activities for individuals with developmental disabilities. Having considered the same, report the same with the following amendment and the recommendation that the bill ought to pass with amendment. Representative Jerry Stringham for the committee. Amendment 1161-H is printed in House Record 14 on pages 40 to 41. Questions on the amendment. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. And the amendment's adopted. Now the question is, ought to pass with amendment. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, nay. The ayes have it, and the report is adopted. The majority of the Committee on Finance, to which is referred House Bill 1595-FN, an act relative to adjustment of the child support guidelines based on parenting time, medical support, and child care expenses. Having considered the same, report the same with the following amendment and the recommendation that the bill ought to pass with amendment, Representative Jess Edwards for the majority of the committee. The minority of the committee, having considered the same and being unable to agree with the majority, report with the recommendation that the bill be referred for interim study. Representative Laura Tolerski for the minority of the committee. Question is on Amendment 1178H, which is printed in House Record 14 on page 41. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. We're going to do a clarification vote. Keep the doors closed. If you're in favor of adopting the amendment, press the green button. If you're opposed, press the red. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. Thank 
all members present had an opportunity to vote. The House will attend to the state of the vote. 197 in the affirmative and 177 very loud nays. The amendments adopted. Now the question is the majority report of ought to pass with amendment. Representative Gibbons is recognized to speak for the committee report. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, House Bill 190, or 1595 uh, it comes with bipartisan um, recommendations from the original committee. I was the one from, from the Democrat side that supported it. Um, this, the formula is supported by our judges. It's supported by attorneys. It is supported by um, the Bureau of Child Support Services staff and parents that were surveyed. Um, New Hampshire is one of nine states without a similar formula. So we have data that this works. Uh, there is some argument that there could be uh, problems in domestic violence relationships. We have not seen that in the studies that we went over all summer long. Um, I would recommend that you vote for this bill. Um, it can work in hand with House Bill 1564, which was already passed. Uh, they are separate, but they are related, and they can work together. Thank you. Representative Chalerski is recognized to speak against the committee report. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Division three of House Finance had two bills before us that both addressed the issue of child support. Because the bills each had similar fiscal notes for system updates, some members of the division believed both could be passed with the fiscal impact of just one bill. House Bill 1564 passed this body earlier today and came out of the policy committee unanimously with strong bipartisan support. This bill, House Bill 1595, also deals with child support, but questions remain. Advocates for families and children like Waypoint, New Hampshire Association of Justice, and New Hampshire Legal Assistance all expressed serious concerns with how the bill addresses unique situations where abuse exists. The bottom line is House Bill 1595 relies on parenting time in the calculation of child support, and that in and of itself is inherently problematic in cases of domestic violence or situations of abuse. Making a direct connection between parenting time and support is highly concerning, and putting a premium on parenting time sets up situations ripe for abuse and does not put the child's well-being above all else. Due to the complexities around the issue, the minority of the committee believes it would be more prudent to interim study House Bill 1595 to fully understand the impact of the bill. This bill will have a significant change on determining child support, but we need to be sure that vulnerable children won't be at risk. The bill needs to be scrutinized further to ensure, without question, that the well-being of every child is first and foremost in all situations. Please join me in pushing the red button to overturn the ought to pass as amended motion so another motion can be made, and I ask for a division vote. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Edwards is recognized to speak for the committee report. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I think what Division did, uh, three did, was uh, actually not out of incompetence, but uh, brilliance, I'll say, because what we noticed was uh, 1564 and 1595 affected the same IT system. And because it would have affected the same IT system, what we recognized was that uh, the, the cost to do 1564 and 1595 uh, were the same. And so since we passed 1564 on a voice vote, essentially 1595 no longer has a financial implication because it's free. So that was not incompetence. That was done intentionally and for good reason. The, what the amendment you just voted for did 
is it agreed with 1595 and 1564, took the definitions out of 1564 and brought them into 1595 to be uh, in accordance with one another. And it established, after years and years of independent reports, cost of about $400,000 total, that there ought to be an independent uh, a formula involved so that in these very uh, confrontational periods of time in uh, the family court system that there is some basis upon which the cost allocation between parents is shared in a parent co-sharing arrangement. And so as a starting point, not the conclusion point is, that has been left to float out there, as a starting point, the formula provides everyone with a common view of what would be fair in this, in this case. And then, the, as always, the judge has the discretion to make whatever determination he or she wants for the best interests of the child. This, this bill has been in, being made now for two, three terms. Uh, we're right there. Let's get this uh, formula in so, so that family court can be less hellish than it is now. So please vote green on the OTPA. Thank you. A division vote's been requested. This will be a division vote. Members, please take your seats. Questions on the Majority Committee report about to pass as amended. This is a division vote. Representative Mooney is recognized for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, colleagues. If I know that we need to update our child support guidelines to more clearly address shared parenting for parents, but this bill is overly complicated, making it difficult for many self-represented parents to use and could cause more drawn out custody disputes. And if I know that House Bill 1564, which we just passed overwhelmingly unanimously, is simpler, fairer, and addresses issues that have been lingering on this very subject since 2018. Lastly, if I know that we should be decisive when spending state funds and therefore send only one good bill to the other side of the wall rather than two potentially conflicting bills, then would I press the red button so that an interim study motion can be made? Thank you. Representative Weiler is recognized for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that House Bill 1595 is important for a formula that it contains that is well supported by all the courts, and if I know that the opposition to it wants it to delve more into domestic violence, which was not a subject before us in this bill, would I now press the green button to bring that very important uh, formula to law? Thank you. We're in the middle of a vote. The question is on the majority committee report about to pass as amended, and this is a division vote. If you're in favor, press the green button. Opposed, press the red. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds.
Have all members present had an opportunity to vote? The House will attend to the state of the vote. 190 in the affirmative, 193 in the negative. The motion fails. Representative Chalersky moves interim study. Are you ready for the question? Okay. Representative Hull requests a roll call. Is that sufficiently seconded? It is sufficiently seconded. This will be a roll call vote. Members, take your seats. Questions on the motion of interim study on House Bill 1595. This is a roll call vote. If you're in favor, press the green button. Opposed, press the red. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. Have all members present had an opportunity to vote? The House will attend to the state of the vote. 208 in the affirmative, 176 in a negative. The motion is adopted. The Committee on Finance, to which is referred House Bill 1598, FNA, an act relative to the Department of Health and Human Services Management of Social Security Payments and Veterans Benefits for Children in Foster Care. Having considered the same report the same with the following amendment and the recommendation that the bill ought to pass with amendment, Representative Mary Jane Walner for the committee. The amendment is 13088, printed on House Record 14 on page 41. The questions on the adoption of the amendment. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed nay. The ayes have it and the amendment's adopted. Now the question is the main motion of ought to pass as amended. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. The ayes have it, and the report's adopted. The majority of the Committee on Finance, to which is referred House Bill 1633, FNA, an act relative to the legalization and regulation of cannabis and making appropriations, therefore, having considered the same report, the same with the following amendment and the recommendation that the bill ought to pass with amendment. Representative Chuck Grassi from the majority of the committee. The minority of the committee, having considered the same and being unable to agree with the majority, report with the following resolution resolved that it is inexpedient to legislate. Representative Kenneth Weiler for the minority of the committee. The questions on the adoption of Amendment 1393H, printed in House Record 14 on pages 41 through 52. You ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. The ayes have it and the amendment's adopted. 
The bill's on second reading and open to further amendment. Representative Leon moves floor amendment 1446H, which is in your seat pockets, and is recognized to speak to her motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This floor, floor amendment is two inches long, not two inches thick. It is, it corrects some language that in committee, we clarified that the rulemaking would be, just um, have some distinct control. I accidentally used the F word franchise, but it's an agency model, so that's corrected. The other is to be fair to cities, so that if they're voting in the future, they won't be, have to wait until the next state election. They'll be able to vote in the next, next election if they turn it down the first time. So I'd ask for your support on this floor amendment. Thank you. The question's on the adoption of the amendment. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor, say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. No. The ayes have it, and the amendment's adopted. Now we are on to the main motion of ought to pass as amended. Representative Weiler is recognized to speak against the committee report. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to oppose any legalization of cannabis, also known as marijuana. We now have the examples of many other states that have legalized this substance over the past few years. Have any of them bragged about how much money they made? Have any of them seen a reduction in petty crime? We have a system of alternative treatment centers that are now serving 14,000 patients who have prescriptions for the drug. Casual use has caused problems, especially for our youth. States legalizing this substance report increases in gang activities and violent crime, as well as problems in mental health and highway safety. They have not eliminated the illegal black market and the drug, especially when they place a tax on it to raise revenue. I read that the state of Oregon is having second thoughts and is making changes in enforcement. We Remember, we'll suspend for a minute. Wicked noisy. So if we're leaving, let's try to leave quietly and then talk once the doors are closed back there. Continue. We have witnessed enough second thoughts in states that legalize marijuana to realize that this is no route for New Hampshire to follow down that rat hole. Please vote no on this bill. Thank you. Represent Representative Ford's recognized to speak against the report. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, colleague. I rise today to speak against uh, 1633. My reasons are both personal and, if you will, health related. I happen to have a sister who has prefrontal dementia as a sequence to using marijuana regularly for a number of years. I won't get into the arguments about causality or whatever. It's very technical, and I'm not sure it's conclusive. But the consequence is that what was once a vibrant young mother is now a person who needs a full-time personal care attendant. She does not recognize her own grandchildren when they gathered with her at Christmas, they asked, does grandma know we're here? Does she know my name? Why doesn't she hug me back? She does not even know she is married. Can you imagine being married to someone who doesn't even recognize you? And her family still cares for her. She needs that constant attention. Therefore, I would urge you to think very seriously about making accessible. And this is not a distant in the past, old time kind of marijuana. This is current. She's still living. But when you get together at Christmas, she walks past you as though you were a person on the street. She doesn't even know who her own brother is. 
she knows no one. Without affect, totally without affect. And without affect, there's no affection. There is no recognition. I cannot in any way imagine approving of access to a substance that could even, what causal or not, bring about that consequence. And therefore, I cannot support this bill. Representative Leon's recognized to speak for the committee report. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. No matter what we do today, and no matter what ultimately happens with this bill, there are a large number of people in New Hampshire that use cannabis. Telling them it's illegal and they shouldn't use it hasn't worked. So I'm not sure how that will stop anybody from using cannabis. Moving to a discussion about why children shouldn't use it because of the brain development is a lot more honest conversation when you can talk about the science instead of just saying, it's illegal, don't do it. The problem right now is a lot of people who choose to use cannabis um, either can drive out of state, they can illegally grow it at home, or they can buy it on the streets. And there's issues with buying it on the streets. What this bill would change is you could have regulated, tested product that's free of contaminants and that is not mixed with other drugs. You would know what was in it, you would know what strain, you would know what concentration. So for those who would choose to do it, it would be safer. And for everybody else, it wouldn't be a discussion that you're having because most people who would use cannabis if it's legal already are. The rule followers aren't going to be the problem. But let's talk a little bit about what this bill specifically does. This meets just about every requirement, every requirement that was previously laid out in order to become law. There was a last minute change to require a franchise where the language required that the it seemed that the franchise agreements would be done in secret. This bill makes it so that the agency model has strong control, but those rules about how they operate would be done through administrative rules so there'd be public comment. It also doesn't set prices. I think this is an ex excellent bill, and quite frankly, I think it's time for us to go ahead and vote on this bill and let the other body deal with it. So I'd appreciate your vote. Thank you. Representative Cahill requests a roll call. Is that sufficiently seconded? It is sufficiently seconded. This will be a roll call vote. Members, take your seats. Let's go, people. Find your seats. The question is on the majority committee report. It ought to pass as amended on House Bill 1633. Settle down. Representative Weil is recognized for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
if a few years from now we begin to experience the problems that all the other states that have legalized this begin to experience with youth problems, traffic problems, and all of a sudden, those of you who uh, member will whoa, that was loud. The member will suspend you recognized for a parliamentary inquiry. Will I then be happy that I am not on the list that approved this? Thank you. Representative Leon is recognized for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that this legislation learns from the states that have gone before us, and if I know that it's high time to pass cannabis legalization, would I then press the green button? Questions on the Majority Committee report about to pass as amended on House Bill 1633, and this is a roll call vote. If you're in favor, press the green button. Opposed, press the red. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. Of all members present had an opportunity to vote. The House will attend to the state of the vote. 239 in the affirmative, 136 in the negative. The report is adopted. <laughs> Representative Richards declared a conflict and did not participate. Committee on Finance, to which we refer to House Bill 1647, FNA, an act relative to the calculation of Group 2 retirement benefits in the retirement system. Having considered the same, report the same with the following amendment and the recommendation that the bill ought to pass with amendment. Representative Gerald Griffin for the committee. The amendment is 1134H, printed on House Record 14 on page 52. Are you ready for the question on the amendment? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed nay. The ayes have it, and the amendment's adopted. Now on to the main motion of ought to pass with amendment. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed nay. No. The ayes have it, and the report is adopted. The majority of the Committee on Finance, to which was referred House Bill 1649FN, an act relative to prohibiting certain products with intentionally added PFAS. Having considered the same, report the same with the following amendment and the recommendation that the bill ought to pass with amendment. Representative Karen Ebel from the majority of the committee. The minority of the committee, having considered the same and being unable to agree with the majority, report with the following resolution resolved that it is inexpedient to legislate. Representative Dan McGuire for the minority of the committee. The majority amendment is 1086H, printed in House Record 14 on page 52. This will be a division vote on the amendment. Members, take your seats.
Questions on the adoption of Amendment 1086H. Representative Dan McGuire is recognized for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I've, if I know that this amendment moves, merely moves the implementation date of this regulation forward 18 months, and if I know it's been said that our finance committee should not be involved in making policy changes, and if I know that there's no financial reason to implement this regulation sooner, and if I know that any purported savings by extra regulation are purely fanciful, would I then press the red button to support the policy decision of the Commerce Committee? Thank you. Representative Ebel is recognized for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that HB 1649, as amended by Commerce, removed many manufacturer requirements leading up to the original effective date of the ban of the sale of consumer products with intentionally added PFAS, and if I know that an earlier effective date of the prohibition better protects public health, which is critical in the face of widespread PFAS contamination, and if I know that the EPA issued new, tighter PFAS water maximum contaminant levels just yesterday that will be expensive to comply with, so starting to remove PFAS from consumer products earlier could help with reducing the PFAS load, reducing expense. Would I now press the green button to support the bipartisan recommendation of the Finance Committee and pass the Committee Amendment 1086H? Thank you very much. The question, <clears throat> the question is on the adoption of Amendment 1086H. As a division vote, if you're in favor, press the green button. Opposed, press the red. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. Of all members present had an opportunity to vote. The House will attend to the state of the vote. 233 in the affirmative, 147 in the negative, the amendments adopted. The bill is on second reading and open to further amendment. Representative Dan McGuire moves floor amendment 1459, which is in your seat pockets. Representative McGuire is recognized to speak to his motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. House Bill 1649 is too broad. It not only affects the nasty stuff that's causing problems in Merrimack, but it sweeps along thousands of other things that are only marginally related to those chemicals. When we considered this bill in the Finance Committee, we were told several times that the bill is not breaking new ground, that it's just Im implementing bans that already exist in other states. I investigated what the state of California is doing in this area, and California is a state with over 25 times our population, and it correspondingly has a much larger DES and much more capability of environmental regulation. They have a large enough market that manufacturers and retailers will cater to their regulations. We do not. If we enact onerous regulation, producers may simply quit our market. This is particularly true if we enact regulation that is in excess of what California does. This amendment concerns the paragraph in the bill that defines food packaging to be banned. 
It is word for word what California has in their PFAS laws. It regulates mostly disposable paper and cardboard items that contain food and beverage, like bags, cups, and boxes, and it also includes utensils and straws. These items, according to the FDA, are the primary source of PFAS in the diet. The FDA announced this past February that grease-proof substances with PFAS, like those found in French fry bo boxes, sandwich wrappers, microwave popcorn bags, coffee cups, and so on, are no longer sold in the United States. The problem with the food packaging language as exists in House Bill 1649 is that it goes far beyond what California and the FDA are regulating. It regulates the outside of the container and the outside of the shipping carton uh, as much as the inside. It specifically regulates labels and the inks used to print them. On every food and beverage box, can, bottle, and bag found in the grocery store. Strangely, it, it doesn't regulate labels and ink on anything else, like toothpaste or shampoo or cleaning products. Okay? PTFE, which is the chemical name for Teflon, is widely used in the printing industry in inks and coatings. It's what gives printed material its rub resistance. When you handle a can in the grocery store, the ink doesn't come off on your fingers. That's frequently the, the um, result of Teflon being used in the ink or in the coating. But Teflon is included in the House Bill 1649's definition of PFAS to be banned, even though Teflon is not a harmful chemical. If we keep, we'll talk about that more on the next amendment, but yes. Um, if we keep. The House will be in order. The member has a right to be heard, and we're not supposed to react. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If we keep House Bill 1649's definition of food containers as including labels and ink, we could be banning every item on a grocery store shelves today. Please press the green button. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Evils recognized to speak against the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I urge this body to reject this floor amendment proposing to amend the definition of food packaging. This definition and this bill were fully vetted by the Policy Committee, the House Commerce Committee, and passed by this House on a voice vote without debate. To change this, this definition now at this late day is ill-advised and unwise. During our Finance Committee work sessions, not one person testified against this bill. And certainly no one took issue with the definition of food packaging. The current HB 1649 definition is the policy position of the House. Food packaging is one of the leading ways in which we're all exposed to PFAS. And that is why food packaging is included in this bill. PFAS are in many forms of packaging, from microwave popcorn to French fry bags to paper plates because of their anti-stick properties. And while it is true, the predominant use of PFAS in food packaging is in connection with paper products. Research also indicates that this is not the exclusive use of PFAS in packaging. And there are more states than California that ban food packaging when you look at the other definitions in the other state. This bill focuses on the intentional addition of PFAS to consumer products. In communications I have had with industry representatives, 
we agreed that the current definition of food packaging was acceptable, as the focus of this bill is intentionally added PFAS. This is certainly no time to be amending the definition of food packaging or anything else in this bill, and especially not with respect to an item that has the potential of so much consumption. Like many bills, this legislation has several moving parts, and one relies upon the other for complete common sense piece of legislation. For these reasons, I urge this body to support the diligent policy work of the Commerce Committee, uphold the strong vote of this House, and support the recommendation of the Finance Committee, and press the red button to reject this amendment. And Mr. Speaker, I request a roll call vote. Representative Ebels requested a roll call vote. Is that sufficiently seconded? That is sufficiently seconded. This will be a roll call vote. Members, take your seats. Questions on the adoption of Amendment 1459-H. This is a roll call vote. Representative Ammon is recognized for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that the FDA and other big regulators are already eliminating PFAS from food packaging, and if I know that not even California is attempting to regulate ink on labels and shipping boxes, and if I don't want to take the chance that grocery store shelves will be bare due to lack of compliant packaging, would I now press the green button to bring us back to a more sensible level of regulation that California has adopted for food packaging? Representative Ebels recognized for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that the FDA um, announcement that's being referred to only apply to three manufacturers of food processing, and there are others, if I know that the definition of PFAS was fully vetted and recommended by the Policy Committee, House Commerce, passed by this House and supported by the Finance Committee, if I know changing a foundational definition here on the floor without vetting whatsoever or public input is ill-advised and unwise and is less protective to the public health. Um, and wait, I'm on the, I need to find my other page. Okay. If I know that some food packaging can contain unwanted PFAS, and by amending this definition, PFAS added ban would only apply to paper products, excluding those products exposing us to more of these hazardous chemicals. And if I know that the point of this bill is to protect the public health and stem the tide of PFAS in our water, air, and soils, and by changing this definition, more PFAS added products can accumulate in our landfills only to leach out later. Would I now press the red button and reflect and reject this floor amendment? Questions on the adoption of Amendment 1459H. This is a roll call vote. If you're in favor, press the green button. Opposed, press the red. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. Thank you. 
all members present had an opportunity to vote. The House will attend to the state of the vote. 165 in the affirmative, 216 in the negative. The amendment fails. The bill is on second reading and open to further amendment. And McGuire offers floor amendment 1460, which is in your seat pockets. For what reason does a member rise? Make a motion. I'm sorry? To make a motion. What's your motion? I would like to request that the comments from the last debate be entered into the permanent journal. Well, and I, you might want to wait till the end. Already, Representative Ebel's recognized to speak against the amendment. Mr. Speaker, I urge this body to reject this floor amendment to change the definition of PFAS. This change basically eviscerates the protections of HB 1649 by severely limiting the types of PFAS molecules that would be banned for use in our everyday products. By making the definition far more limited, many fewer PFAS added products will be banned and we will be left not much better off than we are now. This definition looks backward, not forward. PFOS, PFNA, and PFOA are already being used less by manufacturers because of their hazards. But that doesn't mean manufacturers have stopped using PFAS. These versions of PFAS are simply replaced with another configuration of PFAS. And that, my colleagues, is exactly the problem. This is like a game of whack-a-mole. To achieve the goal of this legislation, we need to look ahead, not behind. And that takes a prod definition that is now included in this bill. We need the broad definition of PFAS to ensure that by changing a hydrogen here or an oxygen there, the PFAS created don't fall outside the definition. The focus has to be on the thing that makes these chemicals so dangerous, and that is the unbreakable carbon-fluorine bond. And no matter how you dress it up, the health hazards remain, like putting lipstick, on a PFAS pig. <laughs> this is precisely the analysis that was done by the House Commerce Committee, which looked at this closely because the definition is one of the cornerstone pieces of this legislation. The broader definition now in the bill is what the Commerce Committee recommended. Why would we completely ignore their analysis? And what is the point of a policy committee? Working with the chair of commerce, certain items were excluded from the bill while leaving the definition intact. And I will say, before the final vote, the chair asked multiple times if there were other industry group that has concerns or needed exclusion. The room had many lobbyists. Not one person responded. And I'm told, as of yesterday, no one has reached out. It's folly to change the definition now at this late date, here on the floor, when this version was never once discussed, either in commerce or in finance. In fact, another definition of PFAS was also rejected that was proposed by my friend from Epsom. It, too, was rejected as too restrictive and it was actually less restrictive than this one is, and not aligned with the policy position adopted by the House. Not one person requested this during our work sessions or spoke against the bill. The harmful health effects are undeniable. Why have a more restrictive definition when there is really so much at stake? 
Even the EPA has now imposed nationwide drinking water standards for a more expanded list of PFAS than what's being proposed in this amendment. The broader definition is protective of the public health. It anticipates future changes to the PFAS molecules by manufacturers and is, in fact, the standard definition for such bans used in many other states and the Department of Defense. It is also the definition already in our own New Hampshire statutes as part of our existing ban of PFAS in firefighting foam. We were in the vanguard adopting that uh, prohibition in 2020. Manufacturers actually like consistency, and they should not have to comply with different, different PFAS definitions in different states, and certainly not just for our small state, than they have to comply with elsewhere. Such a change would also complicate the development of a compliance clearinghouse and make it more expensive. I urge this body on this basis to reject this unnecessary and unwise floor amendment by pressing the red button. And Mr. Speaker, I again request a roll call vote. Representative Dan McGuire is recognized to speak for the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I actually agree with part of that, but I'll get to it in a minute. Uh, this amendment changes the definition of PFAS used in the bill, which currently in the bill is a class of fluorinated organic chemicals containing at least one fully fluorinated carbon, meaning one carbon atom that has one or two fluorines off of it. And it changes it to the somewhat lengthier list that you see in your seat pocket in front of you on, on Amendment uh, 1460H. The problem with the definition used in the bill is that it's this broad, it's huge. And it describes some 15,000 useful chemical compounds, many of which are known not to be harmful. For example, over 100 prescription medications, including Prozac and Lipitor, uh, which is now a generic, it's off patent, called atorvastatin, which is the number one prescription drug in the United States, with 120 million prescriptions issued per year, meets the definition of PFAS in House Bill 1649. Now, I would argue that medications, medications are exempt from 1649, by the way, right? So the bill does not um, ban medications. But I would argue that medications are among the most tested and safest uh, items in the world, right? I mean, these, these are thoroughly tested and uh, for safety, right? And how reliable is the definition we're using if we define as harmful Things, a we use a definition that includes multiple prescription drugs. Right? Doesn't make sense. Similarly, here, we'll get to Teflon here. Similarly, the definition in the bill includes Teflon, which is known as PTFE. Teflon is 100% fully fluorinated carbon atoms. So the definition in House Bill 1649 is is exactly Teflon, right? So if any compound included one Teflon molecule as part of its, you know, larger molecule, then it, then it would be banned, okay? Teflon is widely used in implantable devices like catheters and heart valves and things like that. It's what gives Glide Dental Floss its slippery qualities. Um, Gore-Tex, uh, it gives Gore-Tex its waterproof quality and Teflon tape its ability to seal pipe connections. We have already you talked about its use in inks, right? It's also found in wiring insulation and nonstick cookware. The shirt, tie, and shoes I'm wearing today meet the definition of PFAS in the bill. 
Strangely, none of those things I just mentioned, including my shirt and so on, are regulated by this bill. Uh, but what is banned is any tablecloth, drape, sheet, upholstery, carpet, or textile treatment that includes Teflon. This means that much of what is on the market today that is stain resistant or waterproof in those categories will be banned by this bill. To narrow the definition of PFAS to actually harmful chemicals, I again turned to California. For many years, California has had a labeling law called Proposition 65. You may have seen products labeled for the California market that say something like uh, Proposition 65 warning, this product contains some chemical known to the state of California to cause cancer or birth defects or whatever. Those warnings are on anything that contains any item on a list of dangerous chemicals. That list is 22 pages long. It has hundreds and hundreds of chemicals on it. What you see in this amendment in front of you are all the PFAS items from that list. Right. So, um, verbatim. They include the, the two harmful chemicals found in Merrimack, right? plus, a, plus another one, and all directly related compounds. But they do not include Teflon, Gore-Tex, or Lipitor, none of which gets a warning label in California. The advantage of using this definition, besides targeting chemicals that are actually harmful, is that producers already know which of their products require a California warning and which don't. Um, if those products are in categories banned by House Bill 1649, then they couldn't be sold in, in New Hampshire but manufacturers would not have to do anything special for us, um, as they would with the, with the definition now in the bill, and they would have an easier time uh, complying with our regulations. But I would like to be clear. California has adopted some bans, including on cosmetics and toys and a few other things, that use the definition that's currently in House Bill 1649. Okay. Those bans have not yet gone into effect, right? Just like House Bill 1649 pushes off the effective date, so does California. And I think that California made a mistake by banning things that they themselves do not think deserves a health warning. Right? The, very, the very breadth of that legislation has caused California's Governor Newsom to veto some PFAS bills passed by his legislature. I don't think that the sponsors of House Bill 1649 would like to have the same fate happen to it. Please press the green button. Thank you. Does the member yield for a question? Yes, I do. Representative Hull, you may inquire. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'll make it a quick question. If the harm for these chemicals is truly about getting inside the body, and the bill talks about packaging but not cookware, talks about Gore-Tex fabric clothes and carpets but doesn't talk about implantable medical devices, are we going the correct direction with this bill? Thank you for the question, Representative. Obviously, my, my opinion is no. Representative Ebel is recognized to speak against the amendment. Oh, you want it ready? My bad. Representative Bill Boyd is recognized to speak against the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, through you to my esteemed colleagues of the New Hampshire General Court, 
Today I rise in opposition to the proposed amendment 1460H. The amendment removes Gen X and fluorohexane sulfonic acid from the proposed bill, eliminating the definition and the remedy the language seeks to establish to protect Granite State groundwater. As we all know, New Hampshire's groundwater becomes the source water that percolates through our strata into our streams and rivers, artesian wells, ponds, and lakes. They remain our primary sources for drinking water. Now, I chair the New Hampshire Drinking Water and Groundwater Advisory Commission, which was tasked under RSA 485-F-3 to investigate, manage, and remediate contaminated and polluted groundwater while administering a trust fund of $277 million acquired in 2016 from the state's Exxon Mobil settlement. Since then, the commission has leveraged over $180 million in grant and loans in support of municipalities and village districts' goals of cleaning water and improving water access to its users. Communities like Wyndham, Salem, Jaffrey, Peterborough, Conway, Rochester, and Winchester, to name a few, have benefited from the funding provided through the Drinking Water Commission. We've allocated $9.5 million in source water protection to communities like Westmoreland and Kingston and Northumberland. We've allocated $5 million for a PFAS rebate program for private well owners to implement a point of entry treatment system for their homes. And it doesn't even begin to scratch the surface of other allocations that came from our general fund in support of existing statewide water revolving funds, ARPA money, and the recent news of federal grant money coming to New Hampshire in the amount of $9.7 million to treat PFAS in our water. The commitment to invest millions of dollars into providing access to clean potable water to all Granite States is evident. Now, I ask the question based on the data that I've presented. Why are we investing all this money to remediate PFAS and other pollutants in our drinking water, but we're allowing these PFAS forever chemicals to permeate unfettered in our landfills, which filter down its way into our groundwater? This fi these financial investments that we've been making run contrary to our actions. This floor amendment, as presented, removes two key chemical compounds from the bill which would curtail any meaningful rule to control these chemicals in our solid waste from leaching into our groundwater. Voting against this amendment will permit the underlying bill to offer a significant first step to tackling products with PFAS while allowing the state, the village districts, and municipalities to plan, budget, and manage costs associated with solid waste removal and clean drinking water. Water is an invaluable commodity that is driving New Hampshire's economic growth, housing opportunities, and community public health. If we, as a legislative body, remain serious in addressing these issues, then we must remain vigilant in tackling this issue head on. I sincerely ask that you reject the floor amendment by pressing the red button to ensure we, as citizen legislators, promote clean water for the communities that we represent. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Evils requested a roll call vote. Is that sufficiently seconded? That is sufficiently seconded. This will be a roll call vote. Members, take your seats.
Questions on the adoption of Floor Amendment 1460H, and this is a roll call vote. Representative Ammons recognized for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you again, Mr. Speaker. If I know that this, this bill's definition of PFAS includes over 10,000 useful substances, if I know that among those are compounds in Lipitor, Prozac, Teflon, Gore-Tex, and many other safe items, and if I know that this amendment reduces that list to the known harmful compounds that California warns against, that have caused problems in Merrimack, and that our DES regulates in drinking water, would I now press the green button to make this regulation manageable? Thank you. Representative Evils recognized for parliamentary inquiry. If I know that the definition of PFAS was fully vetted and recommended by the Policy Committee, House Commerce, passed by this House and supported by the Finance Committee, if I know that changing a foundational definition here on the floor without any vetting whatsoever, which was not requested during any hearing, and there has been no public Ill input, is ill-advised and unwise and far less protective of public health. And if I know manufacturers are already familiar with and will be following the definition in HB 1649, because that's what is used in similar bans across the United States, more than in just California, and the new definition simply complicates this bill and makes it more expensive for manufacturers and for DES when it establishes the compliance clearinghouse, would I now press the red button and reject this floor amendment? The question is on the adoption of Amendment 1460H. It's a roll call vote. If you're in favor, press the green button. Opposed, press the red. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. Members present had an opportunity to vote. The House will attend to the state of the vote. 156 in the affirmative, 223 in the negative. The amendment fails. What reason does the member rise? Rise to make a motion. Go ahead. I move to uh, table House Bill 1649. Representative, Representative Verbal moves that House Bill 1649 be laid on the table. Representative Evels requested a roll call. Is that sufficiently seconded? Yep, this will be a roll call vote. Members, take your seats. The question is whether to lay House Bill 1649 on the table. Representative Verbal is recognized for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I know that laws and regulations like this are really the purview of the federal government and are better handled by the federal EPA to give us national uniformity in rules, for consistency to businesses, as other speakers have actually called for earlier. If I know that legislation that goes to ban substances should be banning substances that are bioaccumulative, 
or toxic, or bioaccumulative and toxic, but not entire classes of compounds that number currently into the tens of thousands. And Mr. Speaker, if I know that industry in the United States today is already working diligently towards PFAS-free products because the state of Maine two years ago passed the most restrictive PFAS law in the nation, and so to be able to produce and sell a product in all 50 states, you would have to adhere to the Maine regulations. So if I know that that would make this bill redundant and make it more complicated for businesses involved in interstate commerce, would I now press the green button to table this bill so we can move on uh, with the rest of our business today? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Evil is recognized for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that there is intense concern and interest in the state of New Hampshire in existing PFAS contamination, especially in Merrimack, where they've had the biggest environmental disaster in the state of New Hampshire because of contamination. If I know that New Hampshire doesn't only regulate the way other states do, New Hampshire takes actions that make sense to it. If I know that even though we've been discussing amendments just far on the bill, we haven't yet really had the opportunity to discuss one of the most important bills, um, I would say, that we're talking about today, considering the interest in this issue, would I now press the red button for the public health uh, benefits that a further discussion of this uh, bill and its passage could uh, reveal. Thank you. Questions whether the lay House Bill 1649 on the table. It's a roll call vote. If you're in favor, press the green button. Opposed, press the red. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. Have all members present had an opportunity to vote? The House will attend to the state of the vote. 165 in the affirmative, 215 in the negative. The motion fails. Now, we are on to the main motion, finally, of ought to pass as amended. Representative Carol Brown is recognized to speak against the committee report. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm going to touch on a few different topics around this bill. I was asked to give you a little background of, of some of my experience in this. I worked for DES for 30 years. I worked a good portion of that time in this. Hang on a sec. Thank you. Well, let's just let them go. <laughs> I have often wondered what it feels like to have everyone walk out on you when you're up here. Really? I don't know what's going on here, but Whatever you're going to do, do it quickly. Don't gather and congregate and have conversations over there. If you're going to get out, get out and let the member be heard. This is ridiculous. Sorry, continue for the members who actually do want to pay attention. Okay. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, uh, I was a DE empl DES employee for 30 years. I worked a good portion of that time in the Superfund program, which you know Superfund sites are the most highly contaminated sites in the country. I have been on those sites. I've taken thousands of contaminated groundwater and surface water and soil samples. I've spent a considerable amount of time at the dairy landfill, the old dairy landfill, deciding uh, for EPA whether that should be on the Superfund list. Turns out that it was not. Um, I performed site assessments for a number of other sites to see if they would qualify for the Superfund list. I've also managed the remediation of several hazardous waste sites and uh, oil and gas contaminated sites. So I think I maybe have a little bit more perspective to give this, to give to you for this. So I'm in opposition to this bill, uh, primarily because of some of the reasons you've already heard, that it's very broad and it takes an entire class of compounds and lumps them into the same category of health dangers. Let me give you an example. We have dangerous chemicals around us every day. Benzene is a human carcinogen and it's acutely toxic and can cause death in the correct amounts if you breathe it in. But where is benzene? It's in gasoline. Every one of you is exposed to benzene vapors every time you go to the gas station and fill your tank. Why does that not hurt you? Because it's about dose. It's about how much of that have you taken in. All of these MCLs, uh, maximum contaminant levels, or water quality standard levels, whatever you'd like to call them, every kind of a standard for health is based on a dosage. What is that going to do to you? How much do you have of that? Have you breathed it in or eaten it or, or had a drink of that? Every standard is based on some amount of consumption. As you've heard already today, yesterday EPA came out with their uh, drinking water standards for the five PFAS uh, constituents, the same, uh, and e DES already has it for those same, uh, four of those same five. Those numbers are based on the person drinking a certain amount of that water over a certain amount of time. So it does not mean that if you're exposed to that 10 parts per trillion, whatever the number may be, whichever, whichever of those chemicals it is, it does not mean that you're going to get ill immediately. It doesn't even mean that chronically you might be contracting cancer at a later time. That's up to you to be very specifically understanding of what these standards mean. So if you take an entire class of chemicals and say, we're going to say they're all dangerous because we know these five are fairly dangerous. That's the argument you've heard. I think that that's an overly broad well, look at it. I'm just checking to see if I've covered everything I've written. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about how does this get into our environment? I've heard in the last year and a half that I've been here a number of times, and it's been said at least twice today, if that PFAS, if we have it in our state, it is going to go in a landfill and it is going to go into the drinking water through leachate. And even if you, however you vote on this, you remember this now, if you would, for the future. That's not true. We have six active municipal solid waste landfills in New Hampshire. All of them are double-lined. What that means, you've got the waste and you have a very thick plastic liner. On top of that is a drainage system that collects the leachate. The intent is that that leachate does not get to the plastic liner and even get down to the groundwater through the liner. The leachate is purposefully collected, so it do, we don't just let the liquids build up in a landfill. It's collected and sent off-site for treatment. Depending where the landfill is depends where it goes. Some of our municipal wastewater treatment plants can take leachate, 
because they have industrial pretreatment programs that know how to manage that. And as time moves on, the EPA is adjusting those uh, discharge permits uh, to give them PFAS limits. Some of that leachate is sent off state, some is sent to New Jersey. So all of the leachate in your landfills is being collected. Let's say for sake of argument that that first liner gets a hole in it. Underneath that first liner is another drainage system that can detect flow rates through the drainage system. So they can say, oh look, there's a lot of flow over here in this drainage system. That could mean there's a leak up there and then it can be excavated and repaired. So remember this, no matter how many times someone in here says, if you put something in a landfill, it's going into the groundwater or surface water, that just is not accurate. Please uh, do your homework on that. If, if, you, uh, if, you, uh, if you don't agree with that, you know, do your own homework. Um, so to kind of summarize, the best way, I think, to reduce exposure to PFAS, now, let me back up a little bit. I, I will I'll reiterate what I said earlier. This is very broad. It's a broad bill. It, it includes everything, every, cat, every chemical in the PFAS universe. And EPA and DES have only come up with levels for four or five of those. And that's only if you drink it. That's not if you touch it. That's not if you have it on a cup on some ink. That's only if you consume the water. So the best way to continue this, uh, I think, for the state of New Hampshire is what FDA has already initiated, as you've heard, eliminating some of this from food packaging. But that happened in February. FDA already did that. Continue to properly collect and treat landfill leachate, and therefore uh, that would continue to eliminate PFAS sources to drinking water. Therefore, I would ask you to please press the red button. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Representative Dan McGuire is recognized to speak against the report. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When California's Governor, Governor Newsom vetoed the uh, menstrual products ban bill, the same provision is in House Bill 1649, he said, quote, previously enacted single product chemical bans, which also lack oversight, are proving challenging to implement with inconsistent interpretations and confusion among manufacturers about how to comply with the restrictions. He was referring to bans on food packaging, textiles, and juvenile products, all of which are included to some degree in House Bill 1649. If California is finding these kind of bans challenging to implement, what hope does our DES have to do it? The sheer number of products involved means that enforcement is necessarily going to be selective and almost certainly will target smaller manufacturers. Is DES going to tell Heinz to change the printing on their 57 products? No. And give, no. Not very likely. But they might very well go to a local craft brewer and ask them about the ink used to print their beer labels. If their supplier can't provide the, the satisfactory documentation, there goes the whole brewery business. And then there's carpet. Isn't it likely that stain-resistant carpet is a huge benefit to pet owners? Without it, what kind of cleaning chemicals will they have to use and how often? Or, or we, are we going to see carpet bootlegging from Massachusetts? Who knows? We have no way of knowing the circumstances of all manufacturers and consumers. We can't gauge the value 
of any particular technology to them. Chemicals like these don't come into existence randomly. They are deliberately created, manufactured, designed into products, and purchased, presumably because they are superior to any known alternative. How can we substitute our incomplete judgment for that of millions of individuals? Wouldn't it be better to inform people of the hazards, if hazards exist, and let them make their own decisions, especially when they are the ones most at risk? Please push the red button. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Ebels recognized to speak for the committee report. I'm back. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I rise today in support of HB 1649, an important bipartisan bill that would ban the sale of consumer products in New Hampshire that we use in our everyday lives with PFAS that have been intentionally added by manufacturers. Forgever, forever chemicals are made to never break down, and they don't, creating havoc in their wake. I urge this body to support the Finance Committee's bipartisan ought to pass as amended recommendation on this bill. And as has been mentioned many times, this follows the House's strong voice vote and support and the Commerce Committee um, strong recommendation. We need to stop PFAS contamination in its tracks. Just yesterday, the EPA finally took action requiring drinking water utilities across the country to remove certain PFAS to no greater than four parts per trillion. This is yet another huge wake-up call on the extreme hazards of the chemicals. Regardless of your personal opinions of the health effects, these regulations must be complied with and at huge expense. And as we spend unbelievable amounts of money to remove PFAS, one wonders why the heck do we keep using the stuff for so many consumer products when it is a convenience? It needs to stop. Surface water, groundwater, private wells, wastewater, drinking water, soil, air, landfill, leachate, sludge, left untreated, we know what all these can have in common. PFAS contamination, liver problems, thyroid issues, kidney disease, decreased immunity, and maternal health hazards. We know what these health problems can result from, the PFAS in virtually all of us. It's even in the breast milk of new mothers, it's been found, and their newborns, and it's time to stop our exposure. Is there another state that's been quite as burdened by PFAS contamination? Our Attorney General has sued for millions in damages, and we've already spent about $110 million in tax, tax dollars to mitigate PFAS contamination, and there's no end in sight. So what to do? It's time to focus on the source of PFAS in all our lives. These forever chemicals are in a mind-boggling number of consumer products, ensuring baby mattresses don't stain, food doesn't stick, and we don't get spaghetti stains on our easy chairs. But at what cost? This bill seeks to stem the tide of PFAS in our lives, and it brought together a remarkable, unusual group of stakeholders to support the bill. Landfill operators, wastewater and drinking water utilities, public health organizations, firefighters, the municipal association, clean water advocates, and environmental groups. Only the hazards of something like PFAS could bring together such disparate groups together with one voice and say, make it stop. In three years, manufacturers would be banned from selling specified products in our state to which they've added PFAS. And for the most part, these are products that are most commonly banned in other states. And more states will soon join those states. We should be one of them. The consumer products proposed to be banned are all things we use in our everyday lives, including food packaging, infant and children products, cosmetics, carpets, upholstered furniture, and textiles used in our homes. 
They are either sources of the most direct exposure to us, or they carry the highest PFAS loads into our landfills. And speaking of landfills, PFAS from our trash flow into landfills and then into the collected landfill leachate in the millions and millions of gallons. This toxic leachate is trucked to wastewater treatment plants where it joins sewer and septic waste also containing PFAS. Much PFAS ends up back in sludge that goes right back into the landfills. But much goes into surface and groundwater. That same water is subsequently used for drinking water, where it has to be filtered at extreme cost by our drinking water utilities to ensure our safety. And before long, many wastewater treatment plants will likely have to treat water for PFAS before releasing it, something they don't do now. Our economic burden will be even more enormous. And meanwhile, manufacturers continue to use PFAS in the products that they sell to us. That is the definition of insanity. The costs of this bill are minimal, one DES position and $250,000 to get the program up and running. The reason that Governor Newsom vetoed the bills. Member, member can suspend for a second. Why can't we be silent and listen to people speak? There are plenty of other places to be if that's impossible for you. Let's just get through this. Please continue. Thank you. The reason that the governor vetoed three bills that instituted bans, one of which included uh, feminine hygiene products, is because the way they passed the bills in California, there was no uh, oversight of a um, agency. There was simply a ban put in place with a penalty that was supposed to be enforced by the attorney general. Um, and that was his primary concern. And that was what the issue was in California. For the, um, the health impacts and costs of PFAS remediation and health care unquantifiable. For small money, DES can join a multi-state multi clearinghouse to assess compliance focused on manufacturers and not retailers. DES now belongs to interstate mercury and toxics and packaging clearhouses that have been in effect for a very long time. This was a particular uh, uh, interest of the Commerce Committee when reviewing this bill. Manufacturers know how to use these because we've already banned these toxins. That's how these bans are enforced and it's familiar to business. Once thought of as useful, these chemicals like PFAS are now recognized as harmful, not unlike DDT or MTBE. Usefulness doesn't equate to safety. Now it's time to take a strong stand. These forever chemicals should not be in the air we breathe, the water we drink, or the soil we walk on. We may never be able to cor correct the damage PFAS has already done. But now is the time to look to the future and stop using PFAS in common consumer products. Please join me by pressing the green button to support the bipartisan ought to pass recommendation of the Finance Committee for this bill. Our families, our children, our grandchildren, our state, our world deserve nothing less. Mr. Speaker, I, require, I request a roll call vote. Representative Granger has requested a roll call vote. Is that sufficiently seconded? That is sufficiently seconded. This will be a roll call vote. Members, take your seats.
The House will come to order. The questions on the Majority Committee report about to pass as amended on House Bill 1649. Representative Ammon is recognized for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you for the final time, Mr. Speaker. If I know that PFAS is a subject of intense interest to federal regulators who have significantly more resources than RDES does, if I know that California is finding implementing of these bans so challenging their governor has vetoed three such bills because they're difficult to enforce, and if I know that the leach aid from landfills is collected and processed in an industrial wastewater facility, and the problems in Merrimack were caused by industrial waste, not consumer products. And if I know that industrial operators are the primary source of PFAS in the environment, not the consumer goods banned in this bill, and if I know that we're about to ban, and this list is long, so if I know we're about to ban this list, we're about to ban carpets and rugs, cosmetics, textile treatments, feminine hygiene products, food packaging and containers, juvenile products, personal protective equipment, upholstered furniture, textile furnishings, that's the list verbatim from the bill. These are items, if I know these are items in most of, my, most of our homes and our closets and our wardrobes, would I now press the red button so as not to misdirect our limited DES resources? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Mooney is recognized for a shorter parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, if I know that our state continues to suffer environmentally and physically from the devastating effects of PFAS in our water, air, soil, and if I know that as a result of millions of dollars spent and hundreds upon hundreds of hours in meetings, discussions, research, litigation, negotiations, that there is agreement that only one action will further the harm, will limit further harm. And lastly, if I know that that one action to limit further harm is to prohibit PFAS in certain products as this bill does, then would I join the bipartisan majority of the House Finance Committee and vote on the green button on the motion of ought to pass with amendment? Thank you. Questions on the majority committee report of ought to pass as amended on House Bill 1649 and it's a roll call vote. If you're in favor, press the green button. Opposed, press the red. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. Have all members present had an opportunity to vote. The House will attend to the state of the vote. 233 in the affirmative, 140 in the negative. The report is adopted. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. What reason does a member rise? Uh, for a motion to place the debate in the permanent journal. I, Ryan, we'll put it to a vote. The question is, shall the re previous remarks be placed in the permanent journal? I got a division request. Will that do it? This, if only. This will be a division vote. Members, take your seats.
question is whether or not to print the remarks of the previous debate in the permanent journal. It's a division vote. If you're in favor of pressing the green button, opposed, press the red. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. Have all members present had an opportunity to vote? The House will attend to the state of the vote. 229 in the affirmative, 148 in the negative. The remarks will be printed. Mr. Speaker. For what reason does the member rise? To make a motion. Okay. Um, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to remove um, House Bill 1212 from the table. Okay. Representative Luno moves that House Bill 1212 be removed from the table. This is going to be a division vote. Division. Members, take your seats. The motion is to remove House Bill 1212 from the table. It's going to be a division vote. The chair recognizes Representative Hall for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that House Bill 1212 provides greater access to school meals for children and supports families struggling to make ends meet, and if I know that half of the children in New Hampshire live in households with insufficient food, and if I know that an amendment to House Bill 1212 includes a number of compromises, including reducing the income eligibility cap from 350 to 250 percent of poverty, and has a program cost of approximately $13 million. The member, the member will suspend. This is about removing the bill from the table, not the content of the bill itself. Okay. okay. Uh, and not 50 or $100 million. Would I now press the green button? so that we can debate House Bill 1212, offer an amendment, and feed the kids. Thank you. Chair recognizes Representative Waller for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that the Finance Committee carefully computed how much could be spent from all these bills, and this one was not in that computation, and if I know it is $50 million extra 
that should not be spent, but it will imperil all the other things we've passed. Would I now vote not to take it off the table? Thank you. Push the red button. The motion is to remove House Bill 1212 from the table. This is a division vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. If all members present have the opportunity to vote, House will attain the state of the vote. 188 voting yay, 189 voting nay. I did not vote. The motion fails. Uh, the House will be in order. We still got a little bit of business to do. The more you cooperate, the quicker we'll get done. Majority Committee on Finance, to which was referred House Bill 1656 FN Local, an act relative to adequate education grant amounts for pupils receiving special education services. We get the citizens the same, report the same with the following amendment. The recommendation of Bill ought to pass with amendment. Senator Tracy Emrick for the majority of the committee. Minority of the committee, having considered the same and being unable to agree with the majority, report with the following amendment and the recommendation that the bill ought to pass with amendment. Senator Mary Jane Walner for the minority of the committee. The motion before us is the majority committee report, which is 1 2 amendment, which is 1 2 1 1 H, printed in House Record 14, page 53. Are you ready for the question on the amendment? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed nay. Aye. The ayes have it and the amendment is adopted. Bills on second reading, Bills on second reading open to further amendment. Minority amendment is 1327H, printed in House Record 14, page 53. And Representative Luno is recognized to speak, for and is, is recognized to, speak to the amendment. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'm here to speak in support of Amendment 1327H to House Bill 1656, found on page 53. Simple reason is we need it because it sets the special education grant to public schools to the amount recommended by the bipartisan school funding subcommittee and by the education committee. The committee report printed in House Calendar 7 on House, for House Bill 1656 stated, and I quote, the increased cost for implementing this more appropriate funding mechanism is projected to increase differentiated aid by $35 million. That's the end of the quote. And on February 22nd, this body approved House Bill 1656 at this level by a voice vote. But when the bill got to finance, the fiscal note was cut in half. And that's not what the special subcommittee recommended or what the Education Committee recommended, or what the full House approved. The bill without this amendment doesn't do much to support all public schools. So the Legislative, Legislative Budget Assistant Office drafted this amendment to fix it. So let's vote yes on this amendment. A yes vote is good for kids, good for schools, and good for local property taxpayers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I do request a roll call. Chair recognized Representative Emmerich. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is a very strange additional amendment because uh, there's a lot of unknowns in this particular bill. 
We don't know, we, we do know that the state has approximately 31,000 special education students. That's out of 155,000. So it's about 20% of students require special ed. What the primary focus of this bill was is to change what we're currently doing, which we changed anybody with a, sp a special ed identity gets the same funding. What this bill does is establish A, B, and C funding based on hours of need of particular students. A very good idea, we all agree on it. What we don't agree on is how much we're gonna spend right now. The reason for that is the Department of Education has absolutely no idea how many A, Bs, and Cs rated students there are. So the concept of we've gotta spend more for something we don't know about rather than less, doesn't make a lot of sense. So I, I'm opposed to this. My amendment, which you voted on, which was also prepared by the LBA, was for approximately $17 million. This amendment is for approximately $35 million. So what we're really voting on is how much do we want to spend on this particular bill as it's trying to be implemented. That's what this issue is about. I hope with you go with the original amendment and vote no on this one. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mm. Representative Ullman has requested a roll call. Is that sufficiently seconded? It is sufficiently seconded. Members, take your seats. The motion before us is Minority Amendment 1327H. This is going to be a roll call vote. Chair recognizes Representative Heath for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know HB 1656 came out of the special bipartisan subcommittee recommending $35 million, and Mr. Speaker, if I know further, every school district struggles with the high cost of special education, would I now press the green button to assist our local communities? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Chair, recognize Representative Weiler for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that the 17 million that the committee assigned to solve the special ed problem fits nicely with all the priorities we had to deal with in the committee's 41 bills. And if I further know that the minority amendment will be a major increase in total spending and will imperil the good results we've achieved collectively so far, what I now support the 21 to four decision in this, on this first amendment and push the red button on this second amendment. Thank you. The motion before us is the f amendment 1327H. This is a roll call vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds.
While well, members present have the opportunity to vote, House will attend the state of the vote. 187 to 187, the motion fails. The motion before us now is ought to pass as amended. Are you ready for the question? Roll call. Roll call has been requested. Is that sufficiently seconded? It is sufficiently seconded. This will be a roll call vote. The motion before us ought to pass as amended on 1656. It's a roll call vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. The voting stations are open for 30 seconds. All members present an opportunity to vote. House will tend to stay the vote. 349 voting A, 26 voting A. Committee report is adopted. Committee on Finance to which was referred House Bill 1666 FN, an act relative to incomplete reporting requirements for lobbyists. Having considered the same, report the same with a recommendation the bill ought to pass. Senator Joe Sweeney for the committee. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it, and the committee report is adopted. Committee on Finance, to which was referred House Bill 1669 FN, an act relative to redistricting data, shared through the State Immunization Registry. Having considered the same, report the same with the following amendment. The recommendation the bill ought to pass with amendment. Senator J.R. Hull for the committee. The amendment is 1274H, printed in House Record 14, page 53 through 54. Are you ready for the question on the amendment? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it, and the amendment is adopted. The motion before us now is ought to pass with amendment. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed nay. The ayes have it, and the committee report is adopted. Majority of the Committee on Finance, to which was referred House Bill 1678 FN. An act establishing a New Hampshire Farm to School Local Food Incentive Pilot Program. Considered the same, report the same with the following resolution resolved that is inexpedient to legislate. Senator Dan McGuire for the majority of the committee. Minority of the committee, having considered the same, being unable to agree with the majority, report with a recommendation that the bill ought to pass. Representative Chuck Grassi for the minority of the committee. For what reason does a member rise? Uh, to place HB 1678 on the table. The, the motion is to move re, uh, to uh, report HB 1678 to the table. Division. This is a, going to be a division vote. Members, take your seats.
The motion before us is to lay House Bill 1678 on the table. This is a division vote. The chair recognizes Representative Osborne for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that this proposal is duplicative of a program that was uh, accepted last year by the Fiscal Committee from the federal government, would I press the green button to table uh, this bill right now? Thank you. Chair recognizes Representative Simpson for a parliamentary inquiry. If I know this bill's already passed the House once, and if I know this bill supports New Hampshire farmers, improves food security, and strengthens rural economies, and if I know that the cooperative agreement mentioned in the majority report is a short-term program that ends before the pilot program begins, and finally, if I know that any school in the state can apply and one will be chosen from each county, would I now press the red button to defeat the tabling motion? The motion before us is to table House Bill 1678. This is a division vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you oppose, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. All members present had an opportunity to vote. House will tend to stay to the vote. 181 voting nay, 192 voting nay. The motion fails. We're back to the majority committee report of inexpedient to legislate. The chair recognizes Representative Simpson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. HB 1678 creates a two-year pilot program to get more local food into local schools. The pilot program would encourage schools to spend federal food dollars in New Hampshire while taking a relatively small investment from the state. Um, as I mentioned in my PI, the majority report referenced the collaborative agreement we have now of federal dollars, but that's a short-term program that's set to come to end before the pilot program would begin. And unlike the collaborative agreement, which is only open to schools with a certain number of students receiving free and reduced lunches, the pilot program is open to schools, to any school across the state to apply. And at the end of the pilot program, we would have data from all 10 counties about the feasibility of a statewide program. Investing in our local and regional food systems, especially our rural economy, makes a big difference in the economic viability and the resilience of our small and medium-sized farms and local communities. This bill represents many years of dedicated time and energy from stakeholders across the state, those in the agriculture and food sectors, those in school nutrition programs, and those community members who are part of the infrastructure that makes the local food economy thrive. The Department of Agriculture is willing to support the program as it would benefit our farms and our agricultural food chain. Local food nourishes children, supports local farmers, and strengthens the resili resiliency of our supply chain. There are currently schools across the state who would like to get involved in a farm to school program, but need encouragement. The pilot program would allow one district in each of 10 counties to participate. Schools across the state can apply to the Department of Agriculture, who will put together a committee and criteria to choose participants. Then the department will also gather data to discern if and how to best go about a farm to school incentive program that would be accessible in the future to all schools across the state. A couple months ago, U.S. Secretary of Agriculture Tom Vilsack spoke here in New Hampshire. He described the many ways that we can support farming and rural communities in New Hampshire. One of the ways we can do this is by investing in our local and regional food systems. The Farm to School program does just that. Not only can we help our rural economies, but we can also improve the health and the well-being of our children and the resiliency of our local food system. The initial pilot program isn't asking for much. Let's take the first step in committing to an investment in our farms, our fisheries, and our communities. Thank you. Do you recognize Representative Griffin?
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise in support of the ITL motion on House Bill 1678. This is an unnecessary spending of state funds. This bill is the duplication of a grant from the federal government. Only a few short months ago, the fiscal committee of this legislature approved a federal grant of $559,000 for an incredibly similar school pro farm to school program. 1678 raises almost a quarter of a million of state dollars and duplicates an existing federal grant. Half of that money is raised in the fiscal year 2026, which is the next biennium, and by doing so, it breaks the unwritten rule that we never encumber a future legislator legislature for items that belong in the next budget. If this project is to go forward, it should be brought to the next budget session. I urge you to press the green button and ITL this bill. A division has been requested. Members, take your seats. And if Wool requested a roll call, is that sufficiently seconded? It is sufficiently seconded. Members, take your seats. The motion before us, Majority Committee Report of Inexpedient to Legislate on House Bill 1678. This is a roll call vote. Chair recognize Representative Terlerski for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that this bill supports New Hampshire farmers, improves local food security, and builds community by connecting local producers and our school districts while strengthening the agricultural sector. And if I know that this bill also helps schools so that they have the ability to easily access healthy local produce and products even when the supply chain is threatened. And finally, if I know that HB 1678 is simply a pilot program with moderate funding that encourages getting locally sourced nutritious foods into our schools and onto the plates of school children. Would I now press the red button to overturn this motion so a more appropriate motion can be made? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Chair recognize Representative Waller for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that this program is a duplication of a recent federal grant approved by our fiscal committee for over half a million dollars. And if I know that this bill expends almost a quarter of a million dollars of state money, and if I further know this project and its funding belong in the next budget, where the success of the half million dollar project can be assessed along with the total needs of the state. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I ask you all to press the green, green button the motion before us, a majority committee report of inexpedient to legislate on House Bill 1678. This is a roll call vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds.
If all members present had an opportunity to vote, House will tend to stay to the vote. 179 voting A, 193 voting A. The motion fails. Representative Grassi moves ought to pass. Are you, are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye! Suppose nay. A, div a division has been called for, clar for clarification. Clarification only. Any, nobody in, nobody out. Are you ready for the question now? The motion before us is ought to pass on 1678. This is a division vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. All members present have an opportunity to vote. House will tend to stay to the vote. 191 voting A, 182 voting A. The minority committee report is adopted. Committee on Finance, to which was referred, Senate Bill 252 FN, an act relative to the release of a defendant pending trial directing the establishment of an electronic monitoring program for criminal defendants released on bail, making an appropriation therefore. Consider the same, report the same with the following resolution, resolved that is inexpedient to legislate, Representative Dan McGuire, for the committee. For what reason does the member rise? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Move to lay SB 252 FN on the table. It is a correct motion. The motion is to lay 252 FN on the table. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye! Those opposed nay. Aye! The ayes have it, and House Bill 252 FN is laid on the table. Mr. Speaker. For what reason the member rise? Uh, for a motion. House will be in order. State your motion. I'd like to um, remove House Bill 1212 from the table. It's not dilatory. It is a proper motion. The motion before us is to remove House will be in order is to remove House Bill 1212 from the table. A division has been requested. Members take your seats. The motion before us is to move House Bill 1212 from the table. This is a division vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds.
For all members present have an opportunity to vote. House will tend to stay to the vote. 185 voting A, 188 voting A. The motion fails. Without objection, the bills removed from the consent calendar will be special ordered to their regular place for the, ne in the, for the next session. For what reason does the member rise? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to remove 1560 from the table. This will be a division vote, so members take your seats. The motion before us is to remove 1560 from the table. This is a division vote. The chair recognizes Representative Weiler for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Colleagues, today we have passed with large bipartisan support bail commissioners, disaster relief, Foster Children's Placement, Veterans Court, Group 2 Retirement. Re 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 Representative Weiler, this, 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 this is a parliamentary inquiry. The member will suspend. This is a parliamentary inquiry. If I know that we passed also Group 2 Retirement Fix at $53 million, and I know we also passed Accidental Disability Retirement, and if I further know, none of this can be funded unless 1560 comes off the table and passes by a two-thirds majority because all the money we're relying on to fund all these things is in the Educational Trust Fund. And it cannot be used for the items I just brought out unless it is taken off the table and passed by a two-thirds. So if I know that these are things that are widely supported by all of us here today, would I now take 1560 off the table and pass it so those things can be funded by general funds. Thank you. Chair recognize Press Representative the green button. Press Chair recognize Representative Walner for our parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that this House has decided at least two times that I can remember, and maybe more, to put um, this bill on the table, this bill is there on the table because we know we needed the funds in the Education Trust Fund to uh, fund our obligations to public, ed public education. Um, would I now vote no? The motion is to remove 1560 from the table. This is a division vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. All members present are not to vote. House will tend to say to the vote. 167 voting A, 204 voting A. The motion fails. The chair, recognize, the chair recognizes the member from Auburn, Representative Osborne, for a third reading motion.
Thank you. Resolve that the House now adjourn from the early session, that the business of the late session be in order at the present time, that the reading of bills be by title only and resolutions by caption only, and that all bills ordered to third reading be read a third time by this resolution, and that all titles of bills be the same as adopted, and that they be passed at the present time, and when the House adjourns today, it be to meet at the call of the chair. Question is on the third reading motion. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed nay. The ayes have it. I have one announcement. The automobile dealers are having their annual crossover party over the Holiday Inn. I'm assuming it's going on now. Representative Osborne, that the House stand in recess for the purpose of introduction of bills and roll bills amendment and roll bills report, vacation mode, and, and receiving messages. Are ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. The aye uh, all those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. And the House is in recess to the call of the chair.